I've not had a traditional route to where mm. I'm going. And it feels like I go in that direction, but then I go over there, then I go over there. But then when, when I look back on everything, all the experiences I've had it makes sense. have all benefited yeah. where I'm at. And yeah. it, the good and the bad, you know, everyone has ups and downs. So I'm on this film set, yeah. don't know what I'm doing. I'm doing this scene and there was Billy Murray who was in the bill, EastEnders, yeah. he was in Essex Boys, been in a lot of stuff. Uh, Scott Welsh, who was in, just been in Snatch. Yeah. And there was all these actors that have been in all these, you know, films and TV shows. And they were going, oh, you've done a really good job. Have you acted before? And I was like, no. And I said, well, you should do this. So I've gone home and I'm sort of like, I'm going to tell my wife I'm going to be an actor. And I was like, babe, I've got some great news. And she said, what? And I said, I'm going to be an actor. And she was like, are you taking drugs? And I was like, no. I said, I'm, I'm going to be, I've just done a movie and I'm going to be an actor. And she was like, go and look in the mirror. You're not Brad Pitt. Right? <laughs> Do you know what? I said, I've earned 8,000 pounds this year. And I said, my wife said to me, I was crazy. And I think she was right. And he went, well, what do you want to do? And I said, oh, I really want to be in movies. And he said, why don't you make a movie? You put on events for 20,000 people. You, I was doing 20 events a month at one point. So he said, you know, how hard is it to make a film? And it was a bizarre, surreal time because I'm phoning my friends up and they're going, hello, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm great. Um, listen, me and Fred are putting 10 grand each into this movie. And they're like, what are you talking about? I said, I'm making a film. So obviously, when we actually make the film, AJ, if you're available, I'm, I'm sure go. we will get you. That would be a good show. Have you been in a movie? Nah. See, you have got that movie style look though, AJ. Right? So I, I think it might you be should the outfit. do your movie debut <laughs> Dude, with me. I'm ready. Look, with who, me. who better than to train me than someone else who just, someone went, do you want to be in a movie? And they went, okay, all right, I ain't got nothing else to do. Let's yeah. do it. If there's anything that you want to get off your chest now, um, no, we just, I think we just, I mean, if there's anything uh, that I say that I say, you know, I can always say, you know, we can't put it in. No, nah, definitely not. I've honest, never edited an episode in my life and I'm not going to start now, mate. So be very <laughs> careful about those names that you drop, mate. No, but you know, you can, yeah. you can tell me between me and you, wherever you put the bodies, wherever you've buried them. Um, to be honest, I haven't killed anybody yet, but huh? yeah, I love that you there's said yet, yeah, bro. I love that you said yet, yeah, and I love that we started about five minutes ago, and all this stuff is in there. No, it's good. Terry it's good. Stone good. in the house. How you doing, mate? How you doing? I'm really good. I'm really mate. good. I, I, I'm actually quite honoured to be here, AJ, because I've watched your show, and uh, I never thought I'd actually be sitting here in front of the fire. It's 100 degrees heat outside. <laughs> We're playing chess, and the winner gets the bell or the hammer. So yeah, I'm very it. excited. That's, you know what I mean? <laughs> I, I like the way you did that. And again, it is it's simple, sim similar to what we were talking about before, about growing up in, in England yeah. and knowing how to, you know, yeah, say the right words the at the right time away. and all that <laughs> stuff. No, it's a real honor to have you here with no, me. Thank you. Um, and I know this podcast is either going to get us cancelled or it's going to be one of the most viewed, <laughs> viewed ones. Either way, I'm up for both of them. I'm ready to go. Why Dubai? How come you're in Dubai? Um, so it was a funny story. Um, I came to Dubai eight years ago um, with a family on holiday and... Um, I went because people kept saying, oh, Dubai is great, you should try it. And obviously I'd never been. And I've, I come here and I, I had a great time. But I didn't sort of think, oh, I've got a book to come again next year, you know. Mm -hmm. And I sort of left it. And then over the last sort of eight years, everyone keeps saying to me, oh, my God, Dubai, there's all these opportunities. There's so many things happening there. It's the, it's the crypto capital of the world. And I just keep hearing all this great stuff about Dubai. So this year, um, we, 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 we built um, just before the war, a digital film studio. And, um, fucking and hell, it didn't take long to fucking pitch that, <laughs> did it? Mate? I thought we were going to get halfway through the episode no, before no, we started no, talking no. business. But you asked me what I missed. No, so yeah, I'm just yeah, going to yeah, lead up to it. Right? Yeah, yeah. So we had yeah. this digital film studio and obviously we, 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 we the, the idea of it is in our, in our business, um, obviously we make movies, I act in movies, but as a producer or a content creator, just like a musician, mm. um, what's sort of happened, everything's gone digital and, everybody's giving away the content now. So the people that are creating the content aren't really getting their fair share. And that's really why I built this studio because I just thought there's no point in, you know, making all this content and then, you know, someone else benefits from it. And, and you know, a Amazon, Netflix, Disney uh, and Apple have obviously got a, a, a monopoly on it because they were able to put 100, 200 million pound films on that platform and charge 4.99 a month. So mm. they've got the audience, but what it does is it, 
sort of makes the public it devalues value, the content yeah, so they value, go well yeah. if I spend nine 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 a month on my Apple subscription and I have eight have... of my cousins brothers and sisters <laughs> using the same account as well <laughs> well they all do and yeah. then I've got hundreds of albums for free yeah. which is great for the consumer but bad for the creator so I thought we need to take back some power so long story short we, we built this studio we developed what do you mean I just want to interrupt you talk to me like I'm a free year old because when it comes to okay. crypto we, we, we've had a conversation okay. we both know I don't know much okay what do you mean by built the studio? Okay, because so, it, essentially so, it's in. So, so, ba so it's up there. Yeah. So basically, um, with with um, uh, content because it's digital now, right? There's obviously ways that you can monetize it on the blockchain. So, mm. um, cutting through, you know, uh, without sort of boring you senseless about the process, we we set it up. We we've got a a, a company that's that does a lot of stuff with Rock Nation. Um, we've white labeled their platform. And what we're going to do is we've developed a movie called Tales from the Trap, which is Nines is directing. Who, nice. If any of your viewers know yeah, Nines, yeah, yeah. he's a famous UK rapper. Yeah. And um, it's going to be a little bit like Top Boy, yeah. a little bit like um, Blue Story. It's got that flavour. And the reason we chose that is because obviously UK rap has kind of gone worldwide now. Mm. And uh, you've even got Drake. Except producing top Coming boy, back, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so, 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 what happened was we've we formed a, a partnership with Crypto.com. So they was like, come over to Dubai, blah blah. blah. So I come over, let's met the guys. We're all chatting away. We're working out on all these digital collections we're going to do. And um, I sort of took a breath and I was like, I don't remember Dubai being this good. Mm. And then as I sort of went around and I went to some of the restaurants. Um, I bumped into a dear friend of mine that I've known for 20 years uh, called Matthew Dixon. He um, was like, what are you doing out here? And I said, I'm doing this stuff with Crypto.com. We've got this digital studio. We're doing all these different things. And he said, I'm opening up a property company. Yes, Matt. Yes. Okay. Yes. Shout out to Matt. <laughs> Matt, you I, I, I was watching him. On, I was watching him on his phone while he was there, and he's got this look like he's just like making money as we're talking. He's looking at us like hey, podcast, another property on the market. He's just on it. But he, but he said to me, he said, "I'm setting up out here," and I, and I was like, you know, I'm here having a great week, but I'm 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 falling in love with Dubai basically. Mm. Um, and he said, "Well, I'm opening up an office here." And, and what, what Matt does in, in England, he's got a, a, a brand called Prestige and Village, which is a little bit like Fine and County, Savills, Night Frank. Mm. It's a sort of Rolls Royce type brand, which does off plan properties, does, you know, massive estates, um, you know, hotels, like any, anything anybody wants to sell. He's normally got a pension fund or somebody that wants to buy it. So he looked at the property to buy market, and obviously, being around people with money and talking to entrepreneurs in England, I've heard you got to do Dubai, the property, the this, yeah, the that. Sure. So then Matt sort of said to me, you know, you should you should actually think of being out here more. Um, and and he said, why don't you come and do some stuff for me? And I said, well, I'm working with Crypto.com. I love property. Mm. Um, what can we do? So what we've done is we've created this like ecosystem where um, we're obviously going to be doing off-plan properties, but we're also going to be doing the secondary market as well. But we're going to be buying selling letting um we've also got an fx desk so we've got all this stuff and we've got a luxury vip concierge company um we've got one of those beautiful land jets mm. that we ferry all the vips around so we've literally built all this stuff you know matt's been doing it for sort of 18 months so um i, I have to take a bow to that man yeah. um but obviously i'm gonna um pretend it's all mm. me and i'm <laughs> yeah exactly right <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you can just add it to the imdb and just put it on there <laughs> to be like oh author. Yeah. i'm not just an yeah, actor yeah, yeah, exactly, i don't right? just make movies yeah, yeah. um and uh what 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 shocked me is i mean my contact contacts in property are, are, mm. are, are, are amazing but i've never really utilized them because you know i've always been sort of films acting um and then you know we, we got chatting and i started to reach out to people that i knew that were here and in the uk um, and we're opening the office um, on the 9th of September on the City Walk. So um, it's Anyone exciting times. Around, and I, yeah? it, it just means that I've got an excuse to, to keep coming to, to keep coming back, right? <laughs> it seems like I heard that, Matt, just a bit of free uh, info here. This is gold dust. I heard that every property company should sponsor podcasts as well as part of the niche. No, I think that's... Yeah, so, yeah. Um, yeah, if, you, if, you want, if you want, if you want, if you want to be like the property, I'm just saying I might know a podcast or two that you can. <laughs> See, that's crazy. So, 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 yeah. we're already we're, we're making that's deals it. already, AJ. So it's got good. my money's worth already. <laughs> no, so all right, that's, that's interesting, mate. Because the thing is, when I started doing a bit of research on you and that, I realised that 
there's always something. Right. You're not like going through these major gaps of like if something you're doing something when you realize you've had enough of that. You jump to something completely different, but still excel at that as well. Do you know what's re really weird for me in my life? And I'm sure loads of your guests that have been on here have, have had similar experiences. But I, I wasn't really an academic kid at school. So when I left school, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Mm. And my first job was in McDonald's. Right? My first job was at McDonald's as well. well. All the best people uh, work yeah, in right. McDonald's. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, worked in McDonald's. No, but, but not still working. That's what I meant. If we're yeah, 50 yeah. and I was still working at McDonald's now, yeah. I'd be like, oh. How much did you get an hour? Um, I think it was... Three something. It was so quite, we're not that. See, old. I thought I thought you was a lot younger than me, but I was on two pounds sixty five. You're forty three. I'm forty one. I wish I was forty three. I only, <laughs> funnily enough, again, it was a means to an end. So I right. wanted it was a Jalera Runner fifty cc scooter right. moped, and I wanted it. And I said to my mum, right. "Hey, can I get that?" And she went, <laughs> "We're not that kind of family, mate. Go right. and work." Right. And I was like, "All right, fair enough." Right. And I was like, "How long will it take me to get this thing?" And it was like six months in McDonald's. So I was like, right. all right, I'm, I'm going to do, do it. it. Did it. The day that I got it, I literally wheelied away from McDonald's, right. like waved goodbye. And that was it. I got what I wanted out of it. It was a means to an end. Well, I always joked, right, that because that I, I wrote a book, but I, I always joked that when I do my secondary book, I'm going to actually call it McDonald's Hollywood. Nice. But now... I've changed the name. It's going to be McDonald's to Dubai. The McDonald's right. to Dubai. So, yeah, so we're changing yeah. it all around. We're mixing it up. Yeah. Um, but the um, but but literally, I fell into the club scene in the late eighties. Um, set up a flowering company, which for those that don't know, it, it now obviously it's all Instagram. Yeah, all digital. Digital. Yeah, yeah. But back then it was a piece of paper. I'm at the club and the guy's got a flyer. Yeah. Okay. Have one of these. Yeah, yeah. Oh look, he's DJing. We buy some tickets. Mm. And in the, in those days, you had to go to a shop. You couldn't just go on to. Uh, and, yeah, and, and buy it. Yeah. yeah, so so obviously things have moved on, um, but then but then I, I actually started putting events on, and I become one of the biggest club promoters in the world. And the brands I created was One Nation, which was a drum and bass Crazy, yeah. brand, and people like DJ Hype, <coughs> Andy C, Sigma, DJ Fresh, all these characters that have had like number one hit records of Rita Ora, people mm. like that. Yeah, they all started their careers off for of me. And then in '97, uh, my business partner at the time um, said to me, he said we should look at UK Garage. And I was like, I'm a drum and bass man. Mm -hmm. And I went, no, 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 it's going to be the next big thing. So we set up Garage Nation. That was me and Jason K. Wow. And, uh, you know, people like, you know, uh, Miss Dynamite, Kano, uh, My Dizzy mate, Rascal. Wiley. He, Wiley. He all the time, yeah. They all started he off He lives with out here now as well. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. He right. still doesn't turn up to anything that he says he's going to turn up to. But That's he, he lives out here. Yeah. Yeah. He lives you got, out here. You know him yeah, well. I know him very well, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But, um, but, but, you know, uh, somebody said that Garage Nation are doing events in Dubai. So yeah. um, we did a documentary, obviously, about all the different things we did back in the day. Um, but in the UK, um, there was a lot of issues in the sort of like late 90s, early 2000s, where there was a lot of gun crimes, a lot of knife mm. crime. Obviously, it's still the same now. But yeah, they did it, that trident, right? And uh, yeah. bring, your, bring so, your gun and bring your knife. So we had a, we had a period of time when... When I started doing it, it was fun. And then it went from being fun to having to have special forces guys looking after yeah, me yeah. and having attack dogs and wearing a bulletproof vest. And I thought the fun's gone out of this. Um, and because I was at the top, I thought, you know what? I'm going to just sell this, mm. right? So I put it out for sale, sold it. And I bought a bar and restaurant, which was the stupidest thing I could have done. Yeah. Right? But I've always wanted to have a bar and it's restaurant. It's always a nice <laughs> idea until you realise all yeah. the shit that comes with it. Well, someone said to me, you know, uh, my accountant, funny enough, said to me, he said, if you'd have asked me, I'd have said, how much money do you want to put into it? And then when I told him the number, he said, put it in the middle of the floor and set fire yeah, to yeah, it. Because yeah, yeah. even the good restaurateurs yeah. and bar owners get it wrong. So he said, you're, you're, you're a novice mm. and you're not going to be in there pulling the pints, making the food. Yeah. You know, you'll, you'll just want to be the owner saying, I'm the owner, yeah. right? Which was true. Um, but we had it for three years. And while I was doing that, out of the blue, one of my friends rang me up and said, um, I'm making a movie. Do you want to be in it? So as an like, actor? Yeah, why not? So I'm on this film set, yeah. don't know what I'm doing, right? Um, but I, I like to think that I'm quite funny, right? So I'm doing this scene and there was Billy Murray who was in the bill, EastEnders, yeah. he was in Essex Boys, been in a lot of stuff. Uh, Scott Welsh, who was in, just been in Snatch. Yeah. And there was all these actors that have been in all these, you know, films and TV shows. And they were all going, oh, you've done a really good job. Have you acted before? And I was like, no. And they said, well, you should do this. So I've gone home and I'm sort of like, I'm going to tell my wife I'm going to be an actor. So I'm, I think I was 31 at the time. Yeah. 
I walked in and she's eight months pregnant. So she's, oh, she's literally yeah. laying in bed with the Maltesers on the bump, watching the TV. And I was like, babe, I've got some great news. And she said, what? And I said, I'm going to be an actor. And she was like, are you taking drugs? And I was like, no. I said, I'm, I'm going to be, I've just done a movie and I'm going to be an actor. And she was like, go and look in the mirror. You're not Brad Pitt. Right? <laughs> and I was like, well, thanks for your support. And it made me angry. So I was like, I'm yeah. doing it anyway. Yeah. Um, and then I got an agent um, and realised that I had to go to drama school and I had to sort of learn the craft. So I spent three years doing that. But in between then, I thought, you know, I've sold my business for X amount of money. I've obviously got enough to keep myself going for a while. Mm -hmm. But I the ghosts are here. just had a child, yeah. um, got a wife, I've got a house. And mm -hmm. I'm thinking, if I don't do something else while I'm waiting to be, go to Hollywood, yeah. um, you know, I'm, I'm going to probably at some point run out of money. So the bar and restaurant went and then I started making movies. Um, and that was all done. You started making movies before yeah. you became an actor. So you no, were no, like... no. So I started acting. Yeah. And then while I was learning to act, I just thought, and, and this is what happened because as soon as you get an agent and, and one of my first jobs was EastEnders, which at the time used to get 22 yeah. million people watching it. Now I think Get out of my pub. Yeah. Alfie. <laughs> <laughs> Um, mm. but, but I literally went over um, and I think I, did a, I think I did three jobs in the first year of me being an actor. I think it was uh, my family, EastEnders, and I did a theatre show. And I remember sitting there thinking, I've earned £8,000 this year. Now, obviously, running all those clubs, you was earning a lot more yeah, than that. And I was thinking... I've really made a mistake. My wife was right again. Right? Yeah. So no, we don't need many more of these ones. Like she's already got too many on her belt. Yeah, right? exactly. She's. Yeah. I, I don't want to say I was right, but I was right. Yeah. Um, so then I sort of thought, you know, I'm gonna. I've got, a, and I was with a friend of mine, and we were just sat sat talking like we're talking now. Yeah. And he said, "Oh, where's the acting going?" And I said, "You know what?" I said, "I've earned eight thousand pounds this year." And I said, "My wife said to me I was crazy, and I think she was right." And he went, "Well, what do you want to do?" And I said, oh, "I really want to be in movies." He said, why don't you make a movie? You put on events for 20,000 people. You, I was doing 20 events a month at one point. So he said, you know, how hard is it to make a film? And I said, well, if I made a film, would you put some money in? And he went, yeah, I'll put some money in. I said, well, I'll put some money in. So then I literally got home from this meeting and got on the phone. Got to your wife, guess what? I got more good news. Oh, babe, babe, do you want to put some money in? <laughs> <laughs> but no, what I did, come on, you got to back your husband. I love you. I love you. I kept your more yeah, when yeah. you were pregnant. <laughs> so... So I went down this thing and I'm chatting to all these people and uh, I got and she to, did though, yeah? No, no, she didn't put no, any money, no. but, <laughs> but she ate all the Maltesers. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, um, but I literally got on the phone and it was a bizarre, surreal time because I'm phoning my friends up and they're going, hello, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm great. Um, listen, me and Fred are putting 10 grand each into this movie and they're like, what are you talking about? I said, I'm making a film. Are you coming on board? Are you going to put 10? Yeah, okay, I'll put 10. Grand. So I raised 140,000 and I went off and made a movie and I didn't know what I was doing. It's like the pub and uh, restaurant scenario. Um, but that was like going to film school. So I sort of learned how not to make a film. Yeah. But then the second film we did was a film called Rolling with the Nines, which got BAFTA nominated, won Rain Dance. That was Kano's break before we went into yeah, Top yeah. Boy. Um, we had, you know, the who's who of that scene. We had Estelle, Miss Dynamite. Um, you know, Heartless Crew, like all these people from that era yeah. in, 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 the, in the movie. Um, and then while, while that was happening, somebody approached me with a, a book and they said, oh, this would make a good film. And what happens when you, f you know, you can look at, you make a film and it's not that great, right? But what it did was it put me on a map. So then all the people that had books, stories, that they okay, thought... Yeah. That, so my phone's blowing up. Everyone's going, oh, I've got a book for this. I've got this. I've got a story. So then I started collecting these sort of like IP, you know, yeah, people's yeah, yeah. books and things. And then I developed one into a movie, which was Rise of the Foot Soldier. Um, and there's been six of them now yeah. and a computer game. So. It's, like it's not far from Fast and the Furious, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> um, and, and if you haven't seen it, you know, I obviously wear a silly wig. So, yeah. um, I mean, I know you've ginger seen wig. it, but yeah, ginger wig. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know if, is that film available here? Cause yeah, yeah. I mean, we've got VPNs here, mate. Oh, right, okay. So, so people have probably seen it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but, um, but, but, you know, I've, I've, I've sort of made 33 films. Um, and another reason for being here is, um, a few years ago, a friend of mine was in Abu Dhabi 
and he was talking to somebody mm. and they said, nobody has ever made a film about Shah Varan. And uh, he said, that's a really good idea. So he went and done some research and there's been a lot of books written about the Shah. And, um, and this is so crazy, right? But we managed to get connected to Farah, who was obviously the, 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 the queen, mm. right? And we said, look, we'd really like to make a film about your husband and obviously you and what you all went through. Um, so we developed the script. It's called The Queen for a King and it's with an Oscar winning director and we're actually looking at shooting it in Abu Dhabi. Are you looking for Iranian looking? You know, I speak Farsi, right? Yes. You know? we, we'll get you in. I speak we'll Iranian. You in. <laughs> if you need me there, no problem. Ask him. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I need to grow a bit more, bit more chest hair and a bit more beard, but I'll but, be there, but, mate. But, but, but that's, some, that's obviously a, a big yeah, prestige massive, project. Man. Um, and Filmed uh, here. So I'm having, I'm having meetings while I'm here okay. um, to talk about that. And, um, you know, it's, 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 it's taken us a long time to actually develop it because... We started off with an Oscar-nominated writer and she delivered a great draft of the script. Mm. But then everyone said, well, you need to attach a director now to get the cast. And then the director then wants to do his draft. Mm. So then you end up having... But it's great because we've gone from Oscar-nominated to Oscar winners. Yeah. <laughs> but you've got, uh, you, you got to also make sure that the... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's consistent with... The truth, right? Of course. As well. Of course. Which can I mean, be difficult I mean, sometimes. I mean, because like, you get the, everyone the, telling the, you, yeah, oh, the, no, it was this way. The Shah did this right. and did that and well, the, that. Well, the reality is, like, if you talk to people around the world, is is a little bit of a Marmite character. Mm, some yeah, people yeah. love him, some people hate him. But Argo was an amazing movie. Um, movie yeah. Won all the Oscars, BAFTAs. I think he had 158 awards. Um, I think they made that for around $30 million and it grossed over $230 million. Mm -hmm. So... Massive success. And this is really the prequel to that movie because mm. this is what happened before that. Yeah, yeah, and uh, when, I, when I saw Argo, I was like, wow, there's a montage about the Shah. And I was yeah. like, this is perfect. But at that time, we was gathering, we had the idea about it and we were reading the books and talking to people that knew the Shah. But it, it's really more about um, telling a story about uh, uh, obviously a, a major historical figure mm. in the Middle East. So we're not, we're not, pro show we're not anti show we just want to tell the story it's a true story so you know for me you know some people said some people may be offended by it but the thing is it's not about offending people it's about telling a story and it was mm. 50 years ago so nobody should really have a problem with that film because it's sort of yeah, happened but still, historically. No, but still though like england english people are still talking about 1966 winning the world cup today so right. people remember stuff <laughs> from there and they won't ever let it go. <laughs> Do you know as, you what know, I mean? as you know, I'm not a football fan, so yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, know like, what, I know what happened in 1966. <laughs> they're still but... talking about it now. <laughs> like they won't stop. But yeah. yeah, I think it's a tricky subject because you are going to get the two sides, right? Because yeah. the guys that don't like him really don't like him. Yeah. And the guys that do like him really do like him. And I'm wondering whether they'll allow it in Iran or not. Um, I don't think be it'll be screening at cinema yeah, yeah. in Iran, but um, ag again, it's like, you know, the, the Shah obviously was was overthrown. He left mm. the country. The new regime came in and made it what it wanted. So, as far as I'm concerned, as a as a filmmaker, I'm looking at it and I'm just going, that's the past, mm. right? So the Shah's obviously not going to come back to life and go back in Iran. So I, I wouldn't. I mean, look. It's documenting, right? It's it's just it's just a factual thing, mm. and the thing is, the good thing about making a film about a Marmite character mm. is people that hate him will want to watch it, and people that love him will want to watch it. Yeah, so, they still want to watch it. Yeah, so you create hit, yeah. controversy, but there's nothing controversial in a film. I mean, you know, you can read books about it, you can watch documentaries about it, so mm. it's already out there. But mm. obviously, the way we've done it is in a certain way. So obviously, when we actually make the film, AJ, if you're available, I'm, I'm sure we will get you. That would be a good. Have shot. you been in a movie? Nah. See, you have got that movie star look though, AJ. Right? So I, I it think might you be should the do your movie debut <laughs> Dude, with me. I'm ready. Look, with who, me. who better than to train me than someone else who just, someone went, do you want to be in a movie? And they went, fuck it, all right, I ain't got nothing else to do. Let's yeah. do it. All you got to do is get a skull. Yeah. And to be or, not, or to not to be, be. that is the question, yeah, yeah. and be a tree. That Dude, apparently, that's all a, you need to do. I'm a thespian. It's very easy for me. I'm very good. And I do a good, uh, what's it called? I was going to say role play. That's the wrong word to say. Right, right. Not role play. What's uh Improv, that's the one. Improv, improv. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So good at improv, I didn't even know the word that improv was. But 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 you know something, because uh, you're doing this, yeah. 
you're already performing. So it's like the whole life acting look, anyway, man. Look, look at Rita Ora, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, she's doing movies. Yeah. She hasn't been at drama school, but yeah. she's a performer. So I think as, if you can perform, you can act. Dude, I'm, I'm ready to go. Yeah. Um, let's go back to Rise of the Foot Soldiers. Yeah. For, for those people who don't know the story and who it's based on, right. I want to give a bit more detail on that. Okay. Because I want to lead to somewhere straight after. Okay, cool. Yeah. So... Uh, you know where that's going. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so Rise of the Foot Soldier... Um, the reason I got excited by it was because there was a film called Essex Boys, and mm -hmm. for anybody who knows the story, there was three uh, unsavoury characters called Tony Tucker, Pat Tate, and Craig Rolfe, who terrorised Essex. They they were selling drugs and beating people up. They were basically criminals, and uh, they basically met their demise in a, a upper country lane in Rettendon, and they were all blasted in the face with shotguns. And, and it was on the front page of every newspaper. I think it was a worldwide, you know, oh my God, you know, I can't believe this has happened in Britain. You know, you're mm. not even allowed to carry a gun in Britain. And there's mm. these guys getting, you know, sh shotgunned to death in a country lane at sort of, you know, midnight or three in the morning or whenever it was. So it captured the public's imagination. And uh, I watched Essex Boys and I, I did think Essex Boys as a film wasn't really that great in portraying what these people were like. So... When I got this book um, and, and I decided I wanted to turn that into a movie, um, anybody who likes true crime, especially on the British mm -hmm. side, will remember there was a Football Factory movie, <coughs> which yep. was probably the, the biggest football hooligan movie of all time. And obviously in, 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 in America, Scorsese mm. did Goodfellas, which is one of the biggest gangster films of all time. So I thought I want to create Football Factory meets Goodfellas. And that was the idea behind it. And I don't know if we achieved that or not, but, you know, f considering it spun out into a franchise. And what's crazy is that film was 16 years ago it came out. Mm. And I played Tony Tucker, which is the guy with a silly ginger wig. Mm. And if you look at that first film, if you'd have told me on that film set, you're still going to be doing this in 16 years' time. You're still going to be coming back, putting that wig on yeah. and doing prequels to this one. And I'm like, well, I'm, you know, 20 years yeah, older yeah. now. But the fan base on it is crazy. I mean, you know, since I've been in Dubai, um, you know, you walk you walk anywhere, people stop you. Because a massive, obviously, mm. London, Essex yeah, and UK. Yeah. So it's a, oh, I love your films. Mm. What are you doing here? Are you doing Foot Soldier Dubai? Yeah, yeah. Like, no, I don't think we'd be allowed Sandal to. Sandal Soldier. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Before the sand, before yeah, the camels. Before the sand, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so uh, yeah. So we, you know, so it, it's been, it's, it's, it's definitely uh, some. And there's another film we did called Once Upon a Time in London, which was a period crime film, a little bit like um, Peaky Blinders, yeah. um, but set in in London. And uh, that went out through Netflix, you know, worldwide. So again, you know, we we've, we've sort of had. Um, quite a few sort of crime films mm -hmm. um, that I've produced. The last heist the last was the heist, most yeah. recent one, um, which again was, was uh, you know, had that sort of supernatural element to it. Um, and, you know, lots of people watched it thinking it was just going to be a traditional bank robbery film. Mm. And then it's got this twist at the end and people just go, oh my God, you know. I mean, we actually had people, when we had the premiere, because we had a premiere in, in Leicester Square, and then we had a premiere in Marbella at the Marbella Film Festival. And people actually come out of cinema like in floods of tears. And they were just like, right. I never saw that coming. Oh, it's moved me so much, blah, blah, blah. Because a lot, it's a lot about family, about relationships, yeah, yeah. about people that behave badly and then regretting what they've done but not being able to make amends. So, you know, there was, there's, there was quite a moral story to that one. You know, it wasn't just a, a crime movie, you yeah. know. Um, but, yeah, I mean, you know, we've got Rise of the Foot Soldier Vengeance, which I'm not in, but I'm producing. Why? Um, I don't know, they just said they didn't give the <laughs> no, wig like, a rest. Okay. Yeah, give the, the wig a rest. The wig a rest, no, yeah. right? Is it but, the same wig you've been using the whole time? No, do you know what? Every, do you I don't know where they find these wigs. A little think, box with a, a velvet. Do you know what I believe? <laughs> I actually believe that they, when they do it, they sit there and they go, how ridiculous can we make Terry yeah, yeah. look? Because that wig last time was silly, but let's make it really silly yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think Foot Soldier Origins, which was the one which was, well, that actually was made in COVID. So while the whole world is sort of shut down, we were making this movie and it was crazy because you had to be tested on set, but because you were in a bubble, there was a hundred people on this film yeah. set. So it was sort of like, it was like life was normal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. you're seeing people, you're talking to people, you're drinking, you're eating, and it's all normal. And then I remember leaving that film and I was on a high because I'd done six weeks of 
been in this film and it was amazing. So I was working with Vinnie Jones, Keith mm -hmm. Allen, all these great actors. And um, I remember walking indoors and everyone was just sat there like that. And I walked in, I went, how you doing? Are you all right, guys? And they're like, yeah. And I said, yeah, they had that what are we doing tonight? Thing, yeah. uh, should we get a takeaway? Should we watch Netflix? And I was just like, I can't believe, like, you know, I've just come. And it was, it was like winning the lottery and then mm. waking up the next day and being told you've not, you haven't really won. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Because it's like everyone you experienced was... COVID twice. Life was normal <laughs> and then COVID came and then life became normal for you again. And then you went back into COVID again because you yeah. went back home. But also, what was really bad was they, I don't know what it was like here, but I know in, in, in the UK, I think in December they opened it up again. Mm. And then in January, it was like, oh, we're going to shut it again. So, and I think that period of time from bollocks. January to whenever it was May, it was dark, <clears throat> miserable, mm. wet, typical UK. Um, but obviously that, I think that was the third lockdown mm. and that was for me the worst one. The first one was great because it was sunny. It was actually mm. like being in Dubai. Yeah, yeah, exactly. so yeah, yeah. You could live with that, you yeah. know? So when you do stuff like Rise of the Foot Soldiers and, and true crime movies, do you need to get some sort of approval or do you need to buy the rights of, of these people? Yeah, so, uh, so, so what normally happens is if pe people have written books, uh, you know, you would option their book or their life rights. So mm. you would pay them fee for you know that that those rights and then you that allows you to then make a tv series make a film whatever you want um and then sometimes if they haven't got a book and they've just got stories you can just you know get get the get the stories some stuff is in the public domain though so mm. when we did once upon a time in london obviously the guys that were portrayed in that film were all dead so mm. you couldn't get their permission yeah, yeah um and i don't know what the rules are here but the rules in england are criminals have no rights so if you make a film about them, it's fine. You, I mean, obviously, if they know where you live, you might have yeah, a problem. Yeah. But. That's, what, that's, that's <laughs> what I was going to ask you about. Do you ever feel kind of more accountable doing true crime because you feel like, hold on a minute, if I portray this wrong or if I portray this in the way, then somebody's going to come up to me and go, hold on a minute, nah. Well, to be honest, I mean, and I, did you get any? No, of I've, that? I've never had any problems. I mean, I've always, I've always been respectful and I've always been honourable. So if I've said to somebody, I'm going to pay you, I've paid them. If I've said to somebody, I'm going to turn this into a film, obviously when we developed the scripts, we would say, have a look at that. Are you happy with that? All right? We wouldn't just go off and make it. But who would you go to? For example, with... with oh, no, if they're, they're obviously, dead, yeah. you can't do that. But the thing is, I think... And this is a weird thing, but I was having this conversation with a famous crime writer in England the other day. And he said to me, I actually said to him, I said, you know when... Uh, you write these books and some of them are unauthorized and these people are still walking about. And I said, do you ever worry that, you know, they're going to come for you? Cause you're literally writing books about them, making mm. money out of them without even speaking to them. Mm. And he said, well, he said, I've had quite a few death threats. Wow. And he said, every time I get a death threat, I just register it with the police. So if I do get killed, then they know who's done it. And I was like, that's sort of like a weird way to live. Yeah, yeah, and it's not you like, know, it doesn't matter if you if uh, you know, so I've registered it, you're still so, gonna die. <laughs> so I think, yeah. <laughs> so I think um, from him, his perspective, <clears throat> yeah. obviously, and, and but, but the one thing he said to me, because I interviewed him the other day, because I'm doing a podcast as yeah, well, yeah, um, and uh, when, when I was talking to him, I actually said to him, you know, why do you think these people do these crimes? And then, and he, and he said the same thing. He said, they all start off doing these crimes because they think it's fun, it's cool, it's easy money. He said, then when they go to jail or they get shot and maimed or they, something happens, their brother gets killed, then all of a sudden they realise it's not, not that fun. Mm. And then they always come out and they always want to, the majority of the time, want to reform. They want to go straight. They want to get other people off of that, mm. that crime path. <clears throat> and... Uh, um, but he said, what, what I've noticed about all of them, they all want to be famous. They all mm. want to be notorious. They all yeah, want a film yeah. made about them. They want a book. That's why a lot of them worldwide. Come, come, out of, come out of jail and then they write a book because yeah. they've done their time. So if they write about it now, they can't. It's too late. Yeah. Double jeopardy, right? So um, yeah. <laughs> um, but, um, but, you know, the, I, I, I sort of get it because, um, but then I suppose a lot of these people, if they're not still involved in that, then they can talk about it. But if they were still involved in it, they wouldn't then want to do a book. Yeah, but if they're starting to name drop people and stuff like that who still are involved in it. But I think, no, they're very, I mean, all the people that I've ever spoken to, they've always said these people um, change their names. You know what I mean? Okay. So that they've never ever, 
openly wrote in a book, mm. oh yeah, this is the guy who did this or this is the guy that did that. Yeah, or... but it depends. If you're, if you're saying, oh, lanky one eye and there's a lanky guy with one eye, <laughs> <laughs> he can't escape, doesn't matter what no, name exactly, you give him, right? Exactly. But I think, I've, I've, you know, but I think, again, you know, most of the people that have written books, yeah. they're, they're not really sort of serious. I mean, you haven't, you know, there's been books written about people like Pablo mm. Escobar, about El Chapo, about... Um, you know, Russian mob bosses and things like this, but they haven't actually done it themselves. Mm. So you sort of think, well, if these people are writing these books about them, the people that are really serious aren't, mm. you know, on podcasts and writing books yeah, and yeah, having exactly. films made about them. And also it depends where you are because I'm, I'm sure some countries are different to others where, you know, if you do that in, in Colombia right. about, you know, Escobar and stuff, right. there's more chance that, you know, couple of the minions even if he's gone are going to be right. like they're going to come get yeah. you just well, I, th for well I, th I think i think you know um i mean i've read so many books so, some one of the best books i've ever read and i can't remember the author was called once upon a time in russia mm. and it's about how the, the whole russian sort of business and the world coexists and all these different things happen and i've read the book and i was like this is absolutely dynamite this makes such a great movie and someone said well if you ever made that you are going to be <laughs> going off a building yeah. or waking up for, or not waking up do you know what i mean so i wouldn't go anywhere near that but as a filmmaker stroke content creator i can improve because i love watching movies so yeah. whether it's barbie whether it's um goodfellas whether it's titanic did you watch barbie absolutely I've got a nine-year-old daughter. Okay, but would you have watched Barbie otherwise? Absolutely like, not. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely not. Um, um, because, I mean, you know, because, you know, I mean, I, I think I think my only sort of thing about Barbie when I grew up is I had an action man, and yeah, I yeah, yeah. <laughs> obviously yeah. wanted a girlfriend yeah, for action man. So Barbie, I think yeah, I'll. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but it's quite funny because when that song came out, yeah. um, I think I was in Singapore, and apparently, I don't think I look anything like him, but I look like. The guy who goes, yo, yeah, yo, yeah, Barbie, yeah. let's go Barbie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I actually, people in Singapore came out to me going, no yo, yo, Barbie. And I'm just like going, why do these people keep yeah, saying yeah. that? And then someone showed me the cover and I went, you do look a bit like him. And I was like, I look nothing like him. Yeah, yeah so. because you know how they are, bro. They're like, why? <laughs> you all look the same. You're bald. You must be him, bro. It's the same thing. Mate, that's crazy. Yeah. One thing I want to know, because you, why we're going to get into your podcast, which okay. I think is amazing, especially the the concept behind it, even right. the name alone, is like right. it pretty much when you hear the name of it, you know, you know exactly <laughs> what's coming. Um, but growing up, did you have any affiliations or affinity to gangsters and crime and these kind of things that made you, because most of the movies that you've made right. or been in, they have that crime-centric I've, I've actually thing. done a Christmas movie called Saving Santa. All right, one. Right. No, I've done one. Okay, but, <laughs> but, but um, Santa's but, a criminal owner, yeah, right? No, he's not. He's not. <laughs> um, but, um, but, but no, but... Like, like what about crime captures your... No, I'll tell you what it is. Um, true crime is the biggest thing in the world, whether it's books, whether it's podcasts, whether it's movies, whether it's TV shows. If you look at Netflix, mm, biggest show them. was Breaking yeah. Bad, you know? Yeah. Um, and, Narcos. And, and Narcos, Gamora. Mm. So, so for me... I think I, I lived on a council estate, mm -hmm. you know, when I was working at McDonald's. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I think when you're on a council estate, people say, oh, have you seen this film? Have you seen that film? And I think the first crime film I saw was The Godfather. Because um, someone said, oh, you've got to watch this film. It's mm -hmm. about the mafia. And I watched The Godfather and I was like, that was unbelievable. And then someone said, have you seen Godfather 2? And I was like, is there a Godfather 2? Yeah. So then I got Godfather 2. Godfather 3, I didn't like. Yeah. I thought it was... was a lot of people don't like Lost the plot with that, yeah. but I thought the first two were amazing. Yeah. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, have you not seen Scarface? Have you not seen Goodfellas? Have you not seen... Um, so I ended up watching probably 10 or 15 of the most, probably the best mm. crime films ever made by Scorsese, by all these different amazing American directors. And then I think I just got... I think, you know... But guys tend to like true crime or lads films, mm. and women obviously like, you know, women, lads films as well. But they, they like women love serial killers. No, they do. I don't they know do. why it is, but they love stories, books, and films about serial but, killers. But they pretend they don't. No, no, no. They, they pretend, pretend they, they don't. don't. But you know what? Right. I think now, nowadays, right. as long as it's like right. a movie, right. they tend to. And I think this, a psychologist did some 
well, psychologists, not just one, but right. did some kind of psychology behind it. And there's something about a serial killer that women are attracted to. I mean, I mean, maybe it's because they all have that inside yeah, yeah. of them. Because they're, they're all serial killers in themselves. The yeah, and then that's, that's what I was saying. So do, you think, <laughs> do you think a lot of people watch these kind of movies because it kind of, because they're not involved in that world. So Absolutely. It, it's a way for them to kind of feel like they're I mean, involved. I, listen, in I watched, when I watched The Godfather, yeah, I, I, you know, at, at 16 years of age, you know, I was like, oh, wow, I want to join the mafia. Yeah, right? yeah. But then obviously when you're actually, you're a silly kid working at McDonald's, you know, living on a couch yeah, stand, yeah. you see that thing and you think, oh, and, and I, I grew up uh, single parents, so... Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't have that sort of family. Yeah. So I think the romance of the family and being part of something, I think that, that was an attraction to that film and that world. And, and I think what, what people tend to like about these films is they like to experience it. Mm. They actually want to live it. They just want to experience it. And, um, you know, I think, I think you know, in the UK, obviously there's a lot of crime mm. um, and there's a lot of criminals, but there is in America, there is all around the world. But um, for us, you know, I've, you know, I, th I, th I just think growing up, you know, I used to box, you know, I had a few fights, but you know, I was always focused on getting off the estate, mm. making money. I, I didn't know what I was going to do. Um, I thought I was going to be a manager at McDonald's if I played my cards. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but um, I ended up finding that I had uh, talents to, be organised, and that's why then I started putting on these events. Um, and I think, you know, when I was doing the events, when I was on working at McDonald's, if you'd have said you're going to be one of the biggest club promoters in the world, I'd have said, oh, where'd you get that from? Mm. And then when I was promoting events, if you'd have gone, you're going to sell this, you're going to be an actor and a film producer, I'd have gone, not going to happen. So all of my, all the things mm. in my life, a lot of people feel, you know, you know they're on a, a journey of some sort. And, and, you know, I'm a fairly spiritual guy mm. and I just think all the things that I've done and all the things that I'm doing, um, there's not been a part. It's not like I've been to school, I've been to university, I've got my degree, I've become an accountant. Yeah, there's I now no roadmap. My involved. accountancy firm, yeah, right? Yeah. I've got I own my own accountancy firm. I've not had a traditional route to mm. where I'm going and it feels like I go in that direction but then I go over there then I go over there. But then when, when I look back on everything, all the experiences I've had makes have all benefited yeah. where I'm at. And yeah. the good and the bad, you know, everyone has ups and downs. Mm. Everyone has wins and fails, you know, so. Um, but I'm, I'm sort of grateful to have gone through that experience because yeah. I think what it does is it makes you who you are. So. Yeah, for sure. And I think people underestimate context as well. Yeah. The context that you build along the way in all those different things, how they interweave and connect you into the other paths that are coming and, and well, you might be speaking to someone and not even think that you know five yeah. years down the line i'm, I'm gonna meet that guy again stars are gonna yeah. align and we're gonna end up doing some other weird business together well, well, gonna... well, literally this this happened so so we was having a meeting here yesterday mm. and we were just sat in a restaurant having a chat going through some stuff and then this guy's friend comes over mm. and then he says oh how you doing blah blah how's the food blah blah and we was like you know come and join us and we we was having a laugh and he was like, oh, what do you do? And then we started talking about stuff. And he was going, I love that idea. Oh, you know, I'm doing this. I've done that. I started my tech company. I've just, you know, so just from a chance meeting. But we mm. didn't meet this person to then say, oh, can you bring your mate along? Because yeah, I want to yeah, talk yeah. to him. He just happened organically. Yeah. And uh, I think that's one of the things I love about Dubai is that you can be walking down the road. Yeah. You never know who you're going to bump into. But everybody that I've spoken to, they all want to help. They all want to collaborate. They want to make money. And for me, it feels like the land of opportunity, you know. Dude, it, it, it honestly is. Like, I've been, like I said, we, we spoke before. I've been around the world. Yeah. And I can't find my baby. I don't know why that song's got coming to my head. <laughs> um, I've been around the world and I've seen all different kinds of places. But there's something weird about this place where you feel like if you keep, like, your head down or right. and don't get into the hype right and you're in the right place at the right time regularly and it happens yeah it could be it could be and it happens here like i've noticed i've been in the right place at the right time right quite a few times right where right. like in england it happens once and you're like oh, yeah. i don't know how that happened but here there's so much opportunity and not just that there's so many people that are willing to kind of merge the opportunities together Absolutely. to get something else i mean the thing and is it's crazy it's weird like 
in in the UK, if you do well, people hate you, right? Mm. If you make money, people hate you. It's like, oh, look at him, look at, you know. Nobody, they don't celebrate success. But yeah, what yeah. I like about here, people celebrate success. And f for me, if you've got a big pie of success and you can share it with people and you can all do it together, then yeah. why wouldn't you do it? I mean, yeah. it, you know, it makes absolute sense. And, um, you know, f f from, from being here since April and talking to people and just going through different things and then going back to the UK and then, you know, we've, we've obviously got this, um, you know, this, this Dark Horse yeah. uh, digital film studio. <clears throat> um, we're, we're, we're in their property company here. We work with crypto.com. We're going to be doing a crypto backed property fund, which nobody's done. So we're doing that. Um, I mean, we've got so many exciting things happening. And, and you know, when we actually make that film Tales from a Trap, we're mm. going to fully digitalize that movie. So, again, it's just sort of like you've got 12 months of these artists that have got millions of followers. Yeah. When they put a video on YouTube, 10 million people <laughs> watch it to basically say, have a look at this. And then we can build our own community. And then when we're ready to let them watch the movie, they can watch the movie on their platform. Mm. And w if it's only on their platform, you, it's the only place you can watch it. So obviously it stops the piracy. Yeah. It also means that you get fairly paid. So any content creators that come in will get paid properly. So for us, it's just about retaking mm. control. Mm. And you know, I, th I think the problem with a lot of these sort of broadcasting platforms, streaming platforms, um, is when you go through them and you're looking for stuff to watch, it takes you ages to find you're anything. Two hours, unless you still get, haven't watched anything. If yeah. you get a good recommendation, yeah. you're done. But if yeah. you actually go on there saying, "I want to watch something," you have to go for it all. I've done that a million times yeah. with my wife. Like honestly, it's like eight <laughs> o'clock, and we're like, "Let's watch something on Netflix." And then at ten fifteen, we're like, "Should we just go to bed?" Because we still haven't even found anything. Do you know what I mean? Told off. And that's and that's the thing that you were talking about to touch on a subject earlier. There's too much. Yeah. You know, you go to a restaurant, there's so much stuff on the menu. You're just like, what the fuck? I just, you know, you go to, you go to some places and there's like three things. You've got fish, shrimp and chips. Yeah, which one do you, you want? You go and you go and you get, oh, I'll get all those and that's it. That's done. Yeah. But when you have so much and you're overwhelmed with stuff right. and a lot of it is just slightly different versions of each other, yeah. then people are just like, uh, I, don't, well, I don't know what well, to watch. Well, I think that's one of the problems with advertising because back in the day, obviously, obviously it's probably different in Dubai, but mm. in, in London, you know, a big thing f to advertise was on buses. Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. Um, on, on bus showers. And then if you went on phone the underground... Boxes. Phone boxes. Yeah. On the underground, they'd yeah. have these big sort of posters and, yeah. and adverts. And the problem is now, because it's so much of it, you walk... I used to remember walking down the road and seeing something and thinking, oh, I'm going to watch that. Yeah. Oh, that, that, I might buy that. But now it's just like you walk down the road and you go, I, I, don't, I haven't seen anything today. Mm. And it's sort of like your mind switches you off if you get overloaded. But then lots of people, obviously, on, on the phone. phone. Yeah, so what, what we found, and we did this with a movie last year, is we did what I was talking about doing, because we wanted to do a dry run to make sure mm. what we're doing worked. And we just said to people, if you want to watch this movie, when it comes out, be the first, register here. So we collected all this data where people said, I want to watch it before anyone else. Yeah, just fun and, and then on the day, you went, "There's a, where do you want to watch it on? There's 20 platforms. Went straight to number one on Amazon, right? So it's not because we're geniuses at marketing. It's just mm. because we know everyone's on their phone and that's how you get people. And we know that all the people that like this UK rap music are going to be yeah. on their phones and they're going to want to watch it and they're going to press a button. So what we're doing, and Crypto.com have got 85 million customers worldwide. Yeah. So for them to then push it out to all their network, it's it all sort of makes sense. So I think, you know, it's weird how... I always thought I was going to be going west. Yeah. And then, <laughs> and then going east. East. Do you feel like it, we're going to experience the death of the cinema? I think so. Absolutely. I mean, at the moment, so this also is another reason why we're doing what we're doing. There's a right strike. There's an actor strike. Yeah. Well, what's all that about? Well, you, you know, so I'm not in either guild, so yeah. it doesn't affect me. But essentially what it is, they're upset about AI yeah. because obviously AI can write the scripts. Everything, yeah. AI can replicate the actors. And obviously they're sort of saying, we don't like this, which is fair enough. Mm. But their real gripe is if I'm if I play a lead in a movie or a TV series <clears throat> on HBO or Netflix and it goes to 230 million homes worldwide, I'm only getting paid once. Yeah, yeah. In the old days, you get paid your fee and then there'd be residuals. Yeah. And on something like that, it, you could be getting 
You're getting that three, four, five times check money. every week. Yeah. No, it could be like huge. <coughs> so you do ten grand a day or five grand a day mm. on the show, but then when it actually goes out, and then you get your residuals, you could be getting. Depends just on just like friends, right? Yeah. If you yeah. was in Friends, you wouldn't need to work again. They were making 20 million an episode. But if you did that now, <coughs> you the residuals would be zero. Yeah. So they'd be making yeah, it makes sense a million episodes. So that's why they're all striking. But the, the, the repercussions on cinema is that the, the writer's strike has been going on for four months. Mm. The actor's strike, I think it's either two or three months this month in September. So that means there's six months of no content, mm. right? And when I say no content, I'm talking about, you know, if you're making a 100 million, 200 million pound film, or you're making a TV series, which is big budget, you've got no writers, no actors, you can't make it. So a friend of mine who, who supplies security to these film sets worldwide, um, he's had, you know, he's actually literally got no, no work on. And he said, it's literally like, it's just well. gone. Pfft. So you've got all these studios empty around the world, not just in the UK, but around mm. the world, because they can't, and the actors, if you look at the Venice Film Festival, there's no actors promoting their movies. They're not allowed because they're yeah. on strike, right? But but what that means next year, there'll be a six or nine month, depending on how long this goes on for. But I don't say they're going to solve it because unless Netflix, Amazon, Apple, Disney, all these platforms turn around and say, okay, we're going to give you some residuals, right? What, what right? incentivizes them to do that? No, but the problem is if they do that, they're going to have to go, well, we can't charge you nine ninety nine a month anymore, Fifteen ninety. It's got to be mm. £100 a month. Mm. And then people can go, how can you go from nine ninety nine? Well, we've got to pay everybody their residuals. <laughs> Unsubscribe. Yeah. Not paying that. Do you know what I mean? So there's other people that will pay it, yeah. but it's not going to be 238 million people. Right? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. so, so, so that's the dilemma they're in. And it's sort of like, it's kind of weird. It's like somebody sat there and said, let's give everybody this stuff and only you know, charge this much yeah. for it and we'll get critical mass. Yeah. But the issue is at some point, it might take a few years, but then the, the artists and the creatives are going to start getting upset, saying, well, hang on a minute, I'm doing all the hard work, I'm giving you the content and you're not giving me, you know, I'm not getting remunerated properly. Yeah, yeah. So I understand why they're upset, but I think the problem with the cinemas is, you know, if you've got a multiplex cinema with 12 cinemas, mm. you've got no content, I mean, you're not, how's that going to be sustainable? I mean, You've got no one buying popcorn, no one parking a car. I mean, it'll be all right here in Dubai because we have paid for it all already. It's not a problem. We, <laughs> we bought it all. But no, I get what you're saying. I think it's going to be like theatre. Like you have a niche audience yeah. of those real cinema goers who are real film fans who will Absolutely. go. But there's no way going to fill. It's not so, going to pay so, the rent. So in, in England, there's a, a chain of cinemas called The Electric. and The one in Notting Hill. Uh, yeah. And yeah. Uh, um, uh, what's the other one called? Um uh, but it's a similar concept where they've got these amazing seats. You can have a meal, you can yeah, have yeah. wine, you can have soft drinks, you whatever you want. So you could take yeah. your wife. It's like all of our cinemas here, yeah. so it's not a problem. But that's what I mean. <laughs> Dubai's got it right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, but in England, that's like yeah, yeah, yeah. a VIP experience. Yeah, yeah I know. They got um, it in uh, in Whiteleys as well. Right. But yeah. that's but but I think that will always have an audience because people will say, actually, let's go it's out. A day out, yeah, yeah. Let's have a nice we'll meal. Eat, we'll we'll yeah. go and watch whatever. So even if it's not new stuff, they can watch old stuff. Mm. They can watch a TV thing. They can watch the boxing, the rugby, the UFC, whatever is on, on, on there. They, and they'll pay. Um, and I think the IMAXs will still be around. But I think the problem mm. is, um, and this is the problem for the, for the studios, not the streamers, mm. all of the studios' deals are linked to HBO and to the streamers' box office. So if you put out the Barbie movie and it does mm. a billion, then obviously HBO, Sky, Netflix are going to be buying your big checks out to put that on. But if yeah. there's no box office, then they're going to go, well, we're not going to pay yeah, you that. I get it. So then all of a sudden you're making that film for two, three hundred million and you can't get your money back. I so, think it's crazy that they use their kind of budgets for movies. I mean, yeah. being a filmmaker, be honest. You can make a good film for ten grand, can't you? No, no. I wish you could. I've, I'll be honest with you. I think you can make you can make a good film. Is it the actors? You can make a good film for anywhere between one and five million, right? But I think, like with a Shah, right? Yeah. You can't make that on a, on a low budget because you've got to build palaces. It's a period yeah, yeah. movie. You need big Hollywood actors in it. You know what yeah. I mean? You need big Persian actors in it. So you're never going to be able to make that for five million, yeah. right? But when you make one of these movies for two, three hundred million you do look at it and a friend of mine works on Harry Potter yeah. and they actually built the mountains 
on a film set. And wow. I was like, why don't they just go up a mountain? Yeah. And he went, well, they spent 10 million building this mountain and they filmed on it for like six weeks and then they struck the mountain and then someone in Hollywood said, oh, well, we don't like this. You need to reshoot it. And he said they built another, another 10 mountain million. for another 10 million and done another six week shooting. So they've got to bring all the crew back, all the actors, the directors, everyone's getting paid more money. And he said it was the same thing. He said there was nothing. He said, I looked at it and it was like no difference. So that sort of stuff and that sort of just throwing money around yeah. and uh, paying people these ridiculous sums. I mean, look, if you're Tom Cruise, you're, you, you, you own your money because you're the producer, you're the actor, you know, mm. you're. I mean, Tom Cruise is a phenomenon, right? You know, he's one of the actors that you look at and say, he's worth the money. But then some of them um, probably aren't going to be worth the money. And I think the studios will probably have maybe five or ten movie stars mm. and they'll be in the big movies and that'll be it. So, but You know, the weird thing is watching AI now and seeing what they can do, literally recreating you. They yeah. will make you in this seat yeah. With your voice and the character as well, laughing and joking. And it's and all scary. That stuff. It, it makes you think, can they just make four movies without anyone in 10 years? But that's that's what, what obviously the Actors Union are worried about and also the Writers Guild are worried about because they're saying, well, you can use AI to write the scripts. You don't need us anymore. Yeah. And, and the, I think the problem with AI is everybody loves technology. Everybody likes everything being quick. But I think the, the big issue is, mm. um, you know, if AI does, and this is already happening in law firms, accountancy firms, mm. and, you know, if it's getting automated. So it's when, very everything, dangerous. When, when everything gets automated, yeah. it's like, well, what are we all going to do? And then somebody said to me, oh, it's going to be great because uh, Klaus Schwab said that we're, we're going to own nothing and be happy. And you sort of think, well, if everybody's automated and nobody mm. needs to actually do anything, we probably would be happy because if someone says you can have a free house, you can have free food, you can just meditate all day or go and run every day or go to the gym, you don't have to do anything. A lot yeah, of people... It won't would, be like that. But I think a lot of people would go, actually, do you know what? I like this. No, but because you said, COVID the, you said done... the key word that they will never allow, free house and free food. <clears throat> it will be automated, but they'll still find a way to monetize it and make you work one way or another. Even if it's... You know, holes. yeah, yeah, doing something, <laughs> doing something that they'll find a way for us right. still not to be happy right. and content and, and whatever. Right. I right. don't think, I think the world's so messed up now, right. the way that people just want to make money and they care not about the whole yeah. picture of the world. Like we right. could literally fix the world's problems if you didn't film four blockbuster movies and used <laughs> all of that money. Right. You're talking about what, a billion? Right. To film, you know, four very big Lord of the Rings style level movies. If you just took that, we could fix everything. Do you know, no some, one's do you know it. something? I, I, I tell you another thing that really got me excited about Dubai. Hmm. I was here with uh, my family on holiday uh, in May, and uh, my daughter's nine, and she was walking around, and she you could see she had that sort of twinkle in her eye, and she looked at me, and she said, she said, Daddy, she said, um, she said, do you know something? She said, if I ever built a city, I'd build it like this. And mm. I said, why would you do that? And she said, because it's perfect, right? And I thought, a nine-year-old can see that. My daughter sort of experienced this amazing mm. uh, thing here. And, she, and, she, and I looked at it and I just thought, she's absolutely right, you know. And, and you know, Sheikh Mohammed, what he's mm. actually created here is he's looked at the world and he's literally gone... What's wrong with the world? Yeah, we're going to do that. Let's opposite, actually yeah. build this and actually make it so that... Every, and I don't know anybody that says anything negative mm. about Dubai. Everybody says it. to me, yeah. I've had 10 of my own like personal friends relocate and move here. Some work for big companies and some work for themselves. Some have got businesses they've set up here. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I do actually wonder why the rest of the world aren't looking at Dubai and saying, well, actually, do you know why? Because you lot want to be free. You want to have freedom of everything and freedom of this and that. And you know what? Us as human beings can't be like that. Right. We can't. We need we discipline. Can't, we need discipline, yeah, dude. Absolutely. And it's like, you know, out here, it's like we have four very simple rules. Right. Do you know what I mean? Do what you want. Don't do drugs. Don't bring drugs into the country. Right. Like, when you have these, and and also the punishment right. is like, oh, you got caught with a spliff. Ten years. 
no, no, what fun call, my friend. <laughs> it's done. You're going. Right, right. That's it. We're yeah. putting you away and that's it. We'll see you in right. 10 years right. and then deport you and get you out. Like these simple things, they work because people think twice. They're like, yeah. hold on a minute. We're in England. It's like you get a slap on the wrist and then you're back out and it's not really a serious right. threat. Do you right. know what I mean? And I think, I think it works. I think we need that kind of yeah. strictness and no crime. It's safe. Yeah. You're not going to worry about your son joining a gang or getting stabbed outside a club. And right. that's, it's just unheard of here. Right. Do you know what I mean? And I just think that's beautiful. Like yeah. as a parent, yeah. that's my number one thing. Like forget about the beautiful buildings and the right, beaches right. And, and everything. Like, yeah. And I kind of feel bad for my friends in the UK because sometimes I go back and I'm like, man, you're wearing the same clothes I left you in 10 years ago. Right. You're doing the same thing I left you doing 10 years ago. Right. And it's like they finish work. And the weather's not good. And you know how we are in England with the weather. We're, oh. Whatever the weather's like, we're like that. If, you listen, know what I mean? If you'd have lived in England in yeah. July and August this yeah. year, you'd have definitely come back here. Mate, for the <laughs> four days of summer we get in England, for, the, for those four days, it's one of the best countries in the world. Oh, absolutely. Because everyone's happy, everyone's wearing their short shorts, right. they're out in vests and everyone's... Right. I but, think the only good thing about the UK is when it's sunny. Dude, it's you a know, completely because, different world. Because it changes everyone. Everyone's positive, everyone's happy. It's a different world. It's They're nice connected. Nice I've nice never vibe. seen a country that's connected to the weather right. like the UK. It is awesome. That's why everyone goes there in, in it, July, August. Those it does times. get boring, right? When you yeah. talk to any Brit mm. and you go, and, and they always say, what awful weather we're having. <laughs> Do you know what it is as well? It's like when everyone finishes work, like out here, because you have the weather, right. you finish work, you'll go with a mate. And it's still sunny for another four right. four hours. Yeah. So it's it's just like summer. You go to eat somewhere here, and you're still sitting there three hours later in England. Right. You know, you'll go, you'll eat somewhere, and then it's right. like, okay, we're done now. Yeah. Let's just all split up and go home, kind yeah. of thing. Um, don't get me wrong, I love England. It it gave me so much with my character and everything. But at this age, I need a beach. I need to right. chill. I need to know my kids are safe. And here, I think that just supplies right. all of that with the opportunities as I mean, well. My, I mean, you know, I, like yourself, AJ, you know, I was made in England and I've, I've had fond memories of England and, I, and I've loved growing up there. Um, but I just feel, you know, the, the things that I'm, I'm not particularly a fan of is obviously the rise in crime. Mm -hmm. um, also, you know, I think when COVID came, what it's done, it's actually made a lot of the country, like, just, they're just not interested in working. They're just, mm. you know, they've, they've been out to sit at home and not have to work and they've been paid. And I think it's actually made people just sort of go, actually, I don't really want to sit on a train. And what they're doing in London at the moment is they're rolling out uh, this thing called ULES. I don't know if you've... Oh, fuck's sake, mate. When I've, I stayed in High Wycombe right. at my father-in-law's house. Right. And every time I drove to London, I had to pay... I was like, what is it, congestion charge? He was like, no, no, it's a new thing. If yeah. your car isn't diesel or isn't whatever, you've got to pay right. every time you go but in there. But they've extended that now. And then you've got to drive three miles an hour as well in central London, well, which is another thing. ridiculous. But there was this old fat bird that, that <laughs> walked past me while I was driving. Right. And there was no cars in front of me, but if I, they've got cameras oh, everywhere. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but what I don't understand is driving that slow is... is it's is, more dangerous is, than anything yeah, else. Exactly. And also... The pollution, because obviously yeah. your, your car's idling, really, and it's just spewing out all the flames. get everyone electric. But, but the, the, the thing is with that, you, Les, is I, I know people that are normal people, they have normal jobs, and they're saying, if I leave my house, I'll pay £12.50. And people go, well, that's not too bad. But if you're only on every day as £600 well. yeah. a week, and you've got your wife's on £600 a week, mm. and you've got a mortgage, you've got children, you've got food, you've got bills to pay... And then just for driving your kid to school every day, you get charged for £1.50. It's like a tax on a tax. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of people, I know people that have sold their cars, lots of people have, uh, are looking to sell their houses and move out of the Euless area. And you sort of think, you know, wh where does this come from? It's sort of like, and then his thing is, it's to save lives because of pollution. But it's like, but if they pay £12.50, it's okay. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So as long as you pay... It's like, okay. It's like the turtles only drown with, with, with Sainsbury's bags. And that's why well, we got, well. a, you know, all the other bags are fine, but Sainsbury's ones kill all the turtles and stuff. It's like, oh, come off it, man. Yeah. No, nah, I don't get it. I, don't, I, I just don't get it. And I, I, I don't see it getting better. And also stuff like, I understand living in a certain area should be expensive because right. it's the area or whatever. But when you're paying two grand a month for a studio in Shepherd's Bush, right. and you think, in Dubai, if I pay two grand a month, I'm getting a free bedroom 
massive apartment yeah. with a swimming pool in the community and a gym and security and all that stuff. It's like, why would and you? guaranteed sun. I mean, it's, it's a hard sell, isn't it? Well, it is. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know why anyone would do it. Um, the criminal connection. I think yeah. that we definitely need to talk about that because Absolutely. I feel like, uh, is there a criminal connection there? So this, this will make you laugh, right? <laughs> and this is funny. I like what you did there, right? Yeah, it's very good. Um, but um, I was approached by a company called Kimura Performance okay. in London. And uh, they've done a very successful goalkeeping podcast okay. and a superbike um, podcast. And uh, they said, oh, we, we, have you ever thought about doing a podcast? And loads of people said, you should do a podcast. And I was sort of thinking, have all been done? You know, you've got these characters talking about this, talking about that. And, and then we got chatting and where we've developed lots of TV series, lots of movies, uh, and they're obviously in that crime space. Mm. Someone said, well, if you had a true crime podcast where you interviewed law enforcement, you interviewed uh, the barristers, the king's councils, real criminals, actors that play criminals, famous crime writers, you can kind of use it as a shop window to say this is content so what we've done is we pulled off a massive coup we've had people that have never ever done a podcast before oh. so we've had a few that have obviously and there's people that people know they're like household names but there's people that have never ever done a podcast and i sort of said to them i said what made you say yes mm. right and they said because we know that you're not going to stitch us up and that if we say cut that out you're going to cut it out yeah so um i think having that element of trust and i think also having made those types of films, people always go, oh, well, maybe it make a film about me. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so, but, but you know, I, I, I mean, it, it's going out, uh, you know, it, well, when this podcast goes out, nice. it'll be live. And, um, you know, I think anybody that has any interest in true crime, I mean, the, the King's Council who come on, uh, his stories were just unbelievable. You know, some of the cases that he's defended, um, you know, I mean, just some of the stories. I mean, we, we had a we had a mafia boss mm. that's just come out of uh, being in, in 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 jail for thirty years in America. Uh, no, in in Italy, and okay. he, he he speaks relatively good English. And uh, his daughter come on, uh, and and she she's called a mafia princess, and she she she's had a book. She had Amazon's done a TV series about her. But she came on and talked, and I said to her, being cheeky, I said, um, is your dad still in the witness protection program? And she went, well, sort of, but, you know, he's, I think he wants to actually tell his story. Nice. I said, could you make him an offer? He couldn't refuse and ask him to come on the podcast, and we got him on. And his stories were just, like, unbelievable, where I actually started laughing because he started saying, oh, we had this massive war in Italy where... There were 700 of these guys from uh, this Calabrian Mafia family and there was 700 of us and we were all just killing each other. And he said, so I got the upper hand. There was a war happening in Yugoslavia. So I went to Yugoslavia and brokered a deal with some crazy like general in the Yugoslavian yeah, yeah. army. And he said he was shipping over like rocket launchers, Bloody grenades. Yeah. And, 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 and I just started laughing. And he said, he said, no, no, he goes, it really has happened. And I went, I went, I'm not laughing at what you're saying. I'm yeah. laughing at the absurdity that you're going to Yugoslavia and buying rocket launchers. The initiative. And one of these guys is going to walk out of his house and you're going to be standing yeah, with yeah. a rocket launcher. And the other guys are not <laughs> expecting it. They're like, where did that come from? Um, so, but his story, I mean, that would make, I mean, just an unbelievable movie. That's what I was going to ask you. If you could pick one criminal of all time to make a movie that hasn't been made yet, who would it be? Do you know something? I... I think most of them have been done. Um, I, again, you know, because I grew up on these mafia films mm. uh, and I love The Sopranos. Um, I love uh, Gamora. So I'd say that this guy, his story is so great. Um, and he's writing a book at the moment. So I think I've already said to him when the book comes out, I want to yeah. write. Um, who, who would you get to play him? Do you know something? If money wasn't an option. <sighs> do you know something? The problem is it'd be somebody like... Joe Pesky or De Niro, but the problem is obviously is now... Joe Pesky still alive? They, they, they are still alive, but the, the yeah. problem is obviously now they're too, they're, old, yeah. they're too old. But you, you'd kind AI, of... AI, mate, AI, we'll get, we'll get them young again. But you kind of, you kind of need someone like that yeah. to play him. But when I met him, he's like five foot three. I mean, he's like a tiny little bloke with a suit on, he was so polite. And I was just yeah. like, 
Is this, a, is this the right guy? Yeah, yeah. Sort of, you know, but it, it, it is shocking that, um, and, and, you know, he was very just sort of like, um, matter of fact, when mm. he talks about people, he, he would sort of say, oh, if I don't kill them, they kill me. And, mm. it, and it's just like, you know, I went down the road and this happened. And it's like, you know, you, it's just crazy that this guy's lived this life. It's so like blase but, about but, it, yeah. But he's, he's obviously been in, 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 in prison for 30 years and he was lucky he got out. Mm. Um, but when he got out, he actually said now, he said, I want to change people's lives. He said, what, when I look back at what I did, I'm full of regrets now because I lost 30 years of my life. And, mm. and, and that's the interesting narrative on this thing. A lot of the people that have got trapped up in that stuff, when they've come out the other end, they've then wanted to change lives. They've then wanted to help the kids. They actually want to do something positive. So, you know, they're not just going back into that stuff, which, you know, I think, mm. so it does show. And I think all the films that we've made, they're not glamorising crime. They're not advertising, oh, you know, why don't you be a criminal? It, they're, they're actually saying, if you're a criminal, yes, you're going to go to jail, yeah. you're going to get killed. You know, it's not, you're not, there's no happy ending. Do you know mm. what I mean? So I think if anything, you know, what I wanted to do with, uh, yeah, and talking to the actors as well about how they got into the characters, how they drew, because some of these actresses are like been at private schools, mm. they're well-spoken and they've, been in sort of like you know um you know the, the, these sort of period dramas you know yeah. what i mean so for them to then you know downtown abbey yeah, so yeah, downtown for them to then sort of turn up on a gangster film you know being this sort of hard-nosed sort of gangsters mole or yeah. this sort of gangster chick is, is crazy and, and you sort of think how do you actually get into that from doing that and they've mm. all sort of said that one of the big reference points was sexy beast they watched sexy beast they watched amanda redmond's performance in that and then they said, right, I want to be like Amanda Redman and, wow. uh, you know, or I want to be like Michelle Pfeiffer in Scarface. So they, there's, there's reference points for a lot mm. of these actresses that they aspire to be that person when they play that character, you know, so. It's weird, is it? You tend to find this as well, is that when you get to the top of the, the pyramid when it comes to these gangs and stuff like that, it tends to be someone who is quite nice and quite well-spoken. Because, you know, the lower down you get, you get those big barks and the, right. the henchmen that just want to just like make noise and, and attract attention. Right. But when you get to the top, they're just like businessmen. They're, they're, they're quite like on point when well, it comes well, to all that, the, right? All the, all the people that I've had on my, my podcast uh, today, and we've only done one season, um, but, you know, even the, you know, the, the, the mafia princess that came on, she said, you know, she said, I was born into his life. She said, I didn't mm. want to be a, Gang, so I didn't want to get involved in organized crime, but I was born into it, and that's what I grew up with, and it was that's what the family did. Mm. So I think there's there's a lot of people say you become a product of your environment. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think if you are around positive people, if you're around, so if you're in Dubai, for instance, mm. and you're around positive people, and everyone wants everyone to do well, and everyone wants to make money, then it becomes a self fulfilling prophecy. But if obviously if you're in a council estate in London, mm. and everyone's stabbing people and stealing watches, you're going to probably fall into that thing mm. you know you're not gonna think there's anything wrong with it because you see it every day and that becomes normality and yeah. um you know i know a lot of people um you know don't wear their watches anymore you know there's you know people in london you know they they're all walking around with apple watches people are getting them taken off them and stuff like that in the street and stuff and it's, it's just i just again i just don't feel like that's how it used to be no i don't know whether i've changed and i've got softer or when I lived there, I'd be like, because I know that when I was, I'd say between 18 to 25, right. I'd easily walk down the street with a Rolex on and I wouldn't be worried. But no, I think, I think nobody, uh, I, th I think essentially, I don't think people really knew what the watches were. Really? So I, th I think, I think if you was in that club where you knew what the watch was, you'd come up and go, I love your watch. You know, yeah, it, was a yeah. it was a nice thing. But I think what's happened is, obviously, people have worked out. If you go in a nightclub mm. and there's a guy on a table in London drinking champagne and he's a footballer or he's paying two grand for a table, mm. look at his watch. Oh, look, he's got a diamond Patek yeah, Philippe yeah. on or he's got a, you know, diamond Rolex on. And then yeah. he goes to the toilet and then, you know, for them taking that watch, you know, for, you know what? if they get caught, they probably get told off or, you know... They're not going to go to jail for ten years. They're not yeah, going to get there. Exactly, that's the, that's the point. Not, yeah. There's no in, in, it's, it's no deterrent. 
Uh, but I think I think a lot of it is respect as well. I think people mm. would respect if somebody saw you driving a nice car, people would be like, "Love yeah, your car, mate." Yeah. Now people are like, yeah, and it's just yeah, stupid. I get it. It's it like, just felt different last time. I didn't like, even pack my Rolex because I was like, right. No, There's no, no point, point because, no point. you know, you, you you could be in the wrong place. I mean, they're even doing it with phones. You, you know, you walk out of a train station on your phone and if you're not aware, somebody will come yeah. past you and take it. And you, and you sort of just think... Um, and these but, things aren't even worth anything. No. Like most phones, you can't even open them after you've no. stolen them. Like... Then one, of the, one of the big things that was happening, because one of my friends is in law enforcement in England, and he said one of the big things they were doing was they were looking at people that were walking down the road smartly dressed mm. with an iPhone and then they was actually getting them with their phone because most people had crypto wallets oh, or, or, yeah, or, yeah, yeah, or yeah. their bank accounts on their phones and they were just going, right, transfer Open that up, all yeah. out. Otherwise, you know, you're going to get hurt. So people were just going, do you know what I mean? So they worked out that was another way. So if it's not your watch, it's your phone. So <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy because crime... Organizational crime is one thing. I can understand it because it's organized. Right. And they know what they're doing. You know, they, they have a roadmap of where they want right. to go and what they want to achieve. But it's no way to live a life like the, the way these kids are going yeah. and robbing people and, and like internally and spiritually. It's, it's, it's just no way. But I, to live I a genu life. but I genuinely think a lot of it is out of desperation. Mm. I think, I mean, in England right now, the interest rates are high, the inflation's high, everything's expensive. And if you live there um, and, again, you're on a fixed wage mm -hmm. or you're not on a fixed wage, you know, you put food on the table. And if someone says, if you go out and do this and you know if you get caught, you know, like you can go in a shop and you can steal food, mm -hmm. right? If you know that you can do that. And the worst thing is... Someone's going to say, oh, you're very naughty. We're going to put, yeah. make, give you 100 hours community service. You might look at that and go, well, you know, I can't eat. So if I do get caught, I'll do the community service or I'll get the caution or mm. whatever. But I, th I, I definitely think that for the minor crimes, and they did it in New York, when mm. New York become this kind of like Wild West type place where people were getting robbed in the street and there was junkies wandering around. It was like zero tolerance. Mm. If you do that, you're going to jail. There's not, there's no conversation. There's no, oh, well, you know. I've but they changed that recently, right? Not, I don't know if it's New York, but apparently America made a law now that for looting, you can only get arrested if it's over $800 or something like that. And well, that's why recently yeah. everyone's been just going yeah. to the shops so, and lashing so, everything. So, so, you know, as long as you keep it under $800, you're fine. <laughs> but but it's, it's like, you know, it's like you're inviting people yeah. to behave badly because you're saying to them, you know, and, and there was a there was a thing in the paper the other day where somebody was burgling people's houses and he'd been arrested like 10 or 15 times. And it's like, oh, you know, you're, you're going to get a suspended sentence. And it's like, how many times does this yeah. person have to burgle a house before he actually goes to jail? Yeah. And the thing is, for him, it's like, I got away with it. Yeah, exactly. There's another, so, onto so, another one. And, and then what these people do is talk. So they tell their friends, do you know what? I've been arrested 10 times. Yeah. I'm still not going to jail. So people go, oh, maybe I'll do that then. And, and it's like, if you have to stamp on it, it has to be zero. You know, yeah. that's, again, that's what, what I love about Dubai is, you know. Zero tolerance. There's zero shit, tolerance. Yeah. You know, you, you, the rules are the rules. As long as you follow the rules, you can have a nice life. And, and, and if you're going to break the rules, then obviously you're not going to have a nice time. Mm. And, and if it is so simple and you just sort it of really think, is, if you mate, pick it yeah, up, yeah. pick it up, roll it out around the world, you know, we're not accepting this anymore. You know, and, and I think also it, it stops people wanting to be entrepreneurial. It stops people wanting yeah, to yeah, because it's, cause they look at it as fast money. And also with this, the rent as well that we were talking about. And think yeah. about it. If somebody's like, I can get this apartment on benefits and not work and get paid to just chill, why should I get a job and make two grand and pay one seven for, for this apartment? Well, well, I had this conversation with somebody um, probably about five years ago. We was looking to employ somebody. Mm. And I said, you know, I really like you. I want to give you a job. It's working Monday to Saturday. You know, this is how much you're going to get. He went, do you know what? He said, I really like you and I really like to work with you. But if I do this, I'm worse off. Mm. I said, what do you mean you're worse off? And he said, well, at the moment, I get my housing paid. I get this token, that token, this benefit. Mm. My wife gets this. I get this child thing. And he said, like, if I take this job, I've got to start paying for all this yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. And you just sort of think, how daft that system is that allows yeah. that to happen. And I was in the doctor's um, 
probably about two years ago. And I was sitting in the doctor's waiting for an appointment. And there was two girls sat in the doctor's um, thing and they were chatting. And they were both pregnant. And one of them said to the other one, oh, when's your baby due? Oh, it's probably going to be in a couple of months. When's your baby due? I'm, I'm, I'm having mine in a couple of months. Have you got any more? Yeah, I've got three. Are you still with the fathers? No, they're all different fathers. Oh, why do you have so many babies? So I can get a bigger house. And the other one goes, oh, I'm doing exactly the same thing. And I'm sitting there thinking, "Wow, I pay tax. Yeah. And I'm funding this stuff, do you know what I mean? Mm. And, it's, and it does, I think, you know, things like that should be discouraged. Listen, I'm all for people having children. Mm. I've got three children, mm. do you know what I mean? But I, I think that when you actually have children, yeah, you, you should be, be able, able to yeah. provide for them. And if you can't, I don't think it's fair that you have and them. And you're not setting the right example as well for them in their future life as well. But they're going to look at it and go, yeah. oh, maybe I'll have some kids yeah. and get free house. Again, the environment. <laughs> and stuff. But I, I get it. I just feel like these simple things like here, like for example, Qatar, the World Cup, everyone before, all the England fans, oh no, it's going to be shit, we can't drink and all that stuff. They had the time of their life there. Right. They didn't drink for the time that they were in the thing. Do you know what the problem is though? I, I genuinely think this. I think what happens is people um, are preconceived. Yeah. Concept, you know, it's like, oh, if you go to Dubai, this happens. If you yeah. go to Qatar, that happened. And, and, and people go, oh, you know, well, I'm not going to go there then. But then when you actually come in, the, there, the reality is different. Story, yeah, yeah. But, but, you know, there was lots of people um, going on about, you know, human rights abuses and all this stuff. And, and you sort of think, you know, every government around the world does things that are bad, mm. right? So, you know, you can't just sort of target certain people and say, oh, well, what they're doing is really bad, you know. And then sort of because, I mean, look, for me, the, it's like this live golfing, mm. right? Everybody's going in uproar about this live golfing. But then I know golfers that are playing on it and they're saying, I mean, it's so much money, right? And I don't want to be controlled by yeah. a syndicate, really, saying, well, this is yeah. where you can play and if you're in this, you can't play here. Um, you know, if you're, it's like the footballers, if you're yeah, 35 the there now. and someone goes, I'll give you a million pound a week or whatever it is to come and play here and you're at the end of your career... Why wouldn't you do it? They're doing it now. They're all going to, to Anybody Saudi. would do it. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's the people that aren't doing it that moan about yeah, it. Yeah, but. exactly. It's people not getting any offers. <laughs> That's what it is. That's what it is. Out of all of your guests on the podcast, who has stood out most to you? Who have you been like, bloody hell, this is a... Do you know something? I think, I think out, of the, out of the first 13 episodes, I'd, there was a, there's a law enforcement uh, officer called Detective Chief Inspector. Um, uh, oh, I've got a blank now. You've put me on the spot. Um... <laughs> Uh, Clive Driscoll, okay. Detective Chief Inspector Clive Driscoll, and um, he solved the Stephen Lawrence murders. Oh, wow. And uh, were, were they solved? Yeah, because what happened was it didn't get solved, and then a couple of people got arrested and put in jail yeah. for it, and then the other ones didn't, and then using DNA and different things, and basically going back over it all over again. Yeah. Um, but he was so funny, and, you know, he was... He was the sort of person that you could spend time in his company and they turned his book into a TV series. Wow. And uh, he was a great guest. The, the mob boss was obviously on a different mm. level. Um, I mean, to be honest, they've all been really good. I mean, I, I wouldn't say we've had a bad guest mm. on there, um, but they're, they're all so different. You know, you've got uh, female actresses that play, you know, these sort of harder sort of crime girlfriends was, in yeah. these films. And, uh, you know, they're hearing their stories and also their experiences. You know, one of them was in Hollywood. She had all the Me Too stuff. So actually hearing about all that stuff as well that, 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 that the women are, are sort of putting up with when yeah. they want to just act, you know, hearing their stories um, w was really interesting. Having some actors, you know, one of, one of my, my sort of co-star in The Rise of the Foot Soldier is an actor called Roland Manukian. He's never done a podcast, doesn't do social media, he's completely mm. like, uninterested in anything and I rang him up and I said Roland I'm doing this podcast and we've had some great times we've been in all these films together I said mm. why don't we come on a podcast he went all right then son yeah. I'll be there and we had this great laugh for for two hours and uh literally afterwards he went I can't I can't believe we've done that he said I've never done it before he said, I've really enjoyed it and and the guy who was the directing the podcast he actually said to me he said Terry he said this is dynamite because he said you two were just having a laugh. Yeah, because you're and friends. Like we are, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and, and you know, people are gonna, have never seen that side of, of Roland. Yeah. You know? So for me, it's just, you know, it's about doing something different. And, and I've never done it before. So for me, I've always been on podcasts talking mm. about stuff. So it's nice to 
actually host it's, one. It's, and see no, what yeah, it's wicked, especially being a host, because I was saying this to a friend of mine, we were talking the other day, and I was like, in this day and age, how often do you get to talk to a stranger, an interesting stranger? And actually look people for in the two eyes. Hours. Yeah, yeah. You find for me. two <laughs> hours, clean, nonstop. Yeah. Like, how often do we do that now? Right. It doesn't happen anymore. Yeah. You never get to speak to a, diff- a random person who you're not close to or whatever right. for two hours uninterrupted right. and just have but a conversation. But we're best buddies now. You're yeah, going to be in the movie. Obviously, I'm going to be in the movie. I've got, I got some new properties. <laughs> I've got a sponsor. I've got all that stuff there. Um, who would be, other than me, who would be your ideal guest on the podcast? Um, you can't say me. No, really, really. Someone else but me. Um, oh, God. You've put me on the spot again. Um, do you know something? Um I've, 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 I'd like to get Tom Hardy, okay, because uh, obviously he's played uh, criminals, yeah. uh, famous criminals in in uh, Bronson, uh, Bronson and the Craze. Um, I'd like to get him on. Ray what Winston, about Bronson himself. He's in, he's in prison though, isn't he? He's still in prison. Doesn't mean so you can't go and get one in there. I don't know whether they whether they'll allow it, but I think he'd be an interesting one. Um, uh, I think, um, yeah, I think I think uh, I think Jason Statham. But the thing is, obviously. These are like A-list actors, and uh, I'm sure they will. When they, uh, it's, it's like anything, right? You know, the reason I was a fan of your podcast is because mm. of the way it was produced. Mm. You know, it was, it's, it's done like first class, and um, that's what we want to do with theirs. But obviously, when you're starting it off, you reach out to people; they yeah, want to yeah. see it. Do you yeah, know what yeah, I mean? So yeah. Especially when you're an A-list actor, you go, "I want to see it." So when they see it and they go, "Actually, I'm hearing a great things about your podcast." I'll do it. You know what I mean? Um, and obviously, we're not paying people fees. Yeah, yeah exactly. Some of these people do actually. In, some people, I pay you fees to be on the podcast, yeah. but I'm not um, interested in that. Somebody, no. somebody asked me the other day for a fee, and I was like, "Mate, you got the wrong person." Me, I'm but, not. But the, you know, you can't it, open that. You're door. not going to believe this, but it actually yeah. costs money. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right, he had to pay <laughs> to come on it. No, no, but I just feel like, especially if you're paying someone to come on, they're coming on for the money. They're not coming yeah, on for exactly. from, from a place of love. Do you know what I mean? Exactly. So it's like, it's. A, from the criminal world, who would be your ideal guest? <sighs> oh. Who from the criminal world, if you could have a conversation with, dead or alive, and just have a two-hour conversation, right. and you could be yourself, make right. jokes, make jokes, slights against them, and they wouldn't, right. there'd be no repercussions for me. Yeah. Who would be the ideal criminal? Um, I think, I think on the Italian side, I think, uh, I think John Gotti would be interesting because obviously he was referred to as the Teflon Don, mm. and uh, you know. I, I mean, I, I, I suppose, uh, uh, can I only pick one or can I? You can pick a few. Yeah. yeah, so I think he'd be interesting. Um, I think that uh, Mexican guy, El Chapo. Chapo, yeah. Because, I mean, th- his story's crazy. Yeah. Just, you know, digging tunnels from Mexico to America yeah, yeah. and people on trains. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's just Pushing crazy. Around, yeah. It's just crazy. Um, I think Pablo Escobar would be good. Um, I think uh, the craze would be good. Obviously, the Essex boys would be good. Both of both of them together, but or yeah, separately? why not? And then, but but the thing is, obviously, all these people are dead. But yeah, yeah. I think I, I don't know. I just I, and one of my favourite actors is James Gandolfini, who played yeah. Tony Soprano in The Sopranos. I mean, to get an interview of him, you know, because obviously before The Sopranos, he was just this normal actor, mm. and then he played this mob boss, and everyone just fell in love with him, and. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, he died, didn't he? Yeah. And, and uh, you know, and he was young. I think he was fifty-one. Do you know Joey Diaz? Um, I don't. He played in uh, The Sopranos. Right. The big, uh, the big oh, guy. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Mate, he has. He's the funniest character I've ever seen in my life. He's great. He's got a podcast. You've got to watch it. Um, I've seen it. It's well, hilarious. And he's, and he's and he's always like he's always doing buzzing. motivational speaking. He's always buzzing all the time. Right. He's always on edibles, <laughs> and it's it's just hilarious. So <laughs> him and the guests on there. Um, some people just seem like. They're not putting on a character, right? Like right. when they act in these movies, it's like it's really them just without the crime element. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, but do, do you know what though? They do say that even when they play characters, all good actors play themselves. Do you mm. know what I mean? Because um, obviously they've got to channel something from somewhere. So you've always wanted to have a ginger wig on, then? Do you know, sir? So I think you um, chose that. I You're trying to say you, that it was a studio, to, but it was when you, you get to my age and you've got <laughs> and you've got no hair, I think, any color would do, right? Do, any do, any yeah, color yeah. would do. Um, but it's funny, like when when I was. Uh, when I when I turned forty, um, I, I remember like looking at my hair, and it was going grey, mm. and and I was like, I don't really like having grey hair. And my wife said, Oh, well, why don't you just go and get it dyed? Everyone has their hair dyed now. And I went to the hairdressers, and I was dyeing my hair once a month. And I was sitting there for like six hours with all this stuff on, and I'm just thinking to myself, 
I'm not actually that vain. I don't yeah. actually care, <laughs> right? So I just went, you know what, shave it all off. And then everyone goes, oh, you look so much better without hair. Yeah. I went, you know what? So I just, I've always had this, I, I did, probably in my 20s, then in my 30s, I grew my hair. Mm. Then I went grey, then I just shaved it all off again. <laughs> and that's it, that's the way forward now. <laughs> yeah, and I can wear wigs. Yeah, so. exactly, you can get it. Yeah, I can that's be a more brunette, I can mate. be a redhead, <laughs> it's more be a blonde, whatever you want. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so now you just did something for Rise of the Foot Soldiers, a live event, right, in uh, in the UK? No, so, uh, so, so Rise of the Foot Soldier Vengeance is the new Foot Soldier film that comes out on the 15th of September. Um, but what happened was a company called Stargaze Entertainment contacted me um, probably in March this year and they said nobody's ever done a, a gangster tour in the UK mm. where they've got all the best characters out of these films. So like you've got uh, Nick Moran who was in Lockstock, Frank Harper who's in Lockstock, mm. Ronald Mnookin who was in um, Football Factory, The Business, Rock and Roller. You know, he's done some great movies. Mm. Uh, myself, um, Vass Blackwood, who was Rory Breaker in Lockstock, mm. and he was in Only Fools and Horses. Yeah, I mean, there's, 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 there's eight or nine of these characters. And he said, I want to take you on tour. I want to get a, a club, 1,000 people. You stand at the door. People walk in. They have pictures. They say hello. And then they go and sit down. They have a drink. Could... They have a little bit of food. And then you sit, like on a I'm sofa. Open, yeah. And then p people just say, this is Terry Stone. He's been in Rise of the Foot, so once upon a time in London. Terry tells some funny stories, blah, blah, blah. So there's someone like comparing it. And then they, they then go to the audience and say, what questions? So then they do like a Q&A. Um, probably goes on for like four or five hours, but nobody's actually done it. And uh, the promoter said he's had a really good uptake in ticket sales. And um, they're doing the UK first, but then they're looking to take it on tour to go to the Canary Islands, France, Spain, nice. maybe America. He even said he might do it in Australia, which is crazy. But wow. these films go worldwide. So obviously there's 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 a lot of uh, people that have seen these films. Um, and, you know, you might see me walking down the road. You might see him mm. walking down the road. But you're never going to get us all in one all place. together in one place, yeah, yeah. So if you're a fan of those movies, you've got the guy from Lockstock, the guy from Rise of the Foot Soldiers, the guy from The Business, the guy from The Football Factory... You know, and they're, they're there. Do you know what I mean? Mm, and all, all these guys are fun. Do you know what I mean? They're, mm. they're all um, up for a laugh. Yeah. Um, and I think it'll be a riot. So that's that starts on the, uh, I think the first one's on the 17th of September and it runs through to the 11th of November. So that's stage one. Yes. And then the plan is they're going to then do it again next year, but then they're going to do different towns. So... Um, I think a couple of people said, oh, why isn't it one in Manchester? Why isn't okay. it one in Reading? Yeah. Why isn't it one in Basildon? You know, so they probably end up just keep repeating it and then changing it up. But they do a lot of, it's a lot of these like Comic Con type mm. events yeah, yeah, yeah. where people can meet. Their, Go get some science know, stuff. and They can meet R2-D2 or, yeah. you know, the pilot out of Star Wars. Yeah, but yeah. this is, you know, specifically it's about. It's actually quite smart. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I said to the guy, I said, I think this is a great idea. He said, well, no one's ever done it. So, you know. Um, yeah, it looks so, good. So that's, that's something else that we're doing. And uh, and then, you know, as I said, you know, the 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 property company here, w w because we're doing the concierge and we're, we're going to be doing brunches, we've got a big polo event because uh, the company's a big support of polo. Um, nice. And uh, the, the, in England, there's a, there's, there's a, uh, it's called PV Group um, Polo, Youth Polo, mm. and it's all about the kids. And uh, yes. uh, Matthew Dixon, who's who, who's the CEO and owner mm. of the company, he, um, he he does a lot of stuff to raise money for children's charities and, and cancer yeah. charities. So obviously he's bringing that to Dubai on the 24th yeah. of February next year. So we're going to have a big party. So if you're around, AJ, you'll Dude, have to I'm be a guest. I have a feeling that he's going to be living here soon. Right. I mean, look. If you need a property, I've got a guy who can hook you up. You can hook me up with Matt. Yeah, yeah. Hook you up. Don't worry about a bank account. I'll get you some crypto, and we'll get it going, man. Right. No, dude. It's been an absolute pleasure. Hi, Jay. Thanks for having me on. I feel like we could do another two hours. Is there anything that you feel like we missed out? To be honest, do you know something? This whenever we I've done these, I always walk down around and go. We should talk about this. We should talk about that. But I think I think you know, there's so many. Um, exciting things happening in my life right now, and we've we've discussed a lot of them, um, mm. uh, if not all of them. So, you know, it'd be interesting to see um, if the Criminal Connection podcast gets to number one. Yeah, I hope it does. Yeah, um, and uh, you know that, that actually there is something quite funny. The at the end of the the season, 
And the director said to me, he said, I'm gonna, I've got a new nickname for you. And I said, what's that? And he said, I'm going to call you the Podfather. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. It works. It works. <laughs> so I said, what I need to do, I need to get a little moustache. Yeah. Get, um, you need put, to recreate put, the white uh, picture. You know, that famous got black and white. Got the tissues, poof, yeah, yeah. poof in her mouth, little pussy and, cat. And a mic as well on top. <laughs> on top, it works. I feel like it works. Uh, no, but look, if there's anything we start, once you move here, then we can... Uh, yeah. No, I guarantee, I guarantee you... You're going right? to move here, bro. I, I, pff, look, look, my, my wife and my kids are obviously in the UK. Mm. Um, and, uh, yeah, my kids are still at school. Um, so they got good schools here. So, well, that, you know what? She I've, did say that I've, it's magical here. Yeah, I've actually said, I've, I've done all the sales power yeah, yeah. On, on the wife and the children. Um, but I think, I think the reality is I've got all these new business opportunities mm. in Dubai. I obviously want to make a movie. I've got a property company. We've got all these different things happening with crypto.com. So I'm literally sitting here at the moment. And the great thing about Dubai for me is if I come here for two weeks... The UK doesn't wake up in yeah, my yeah. business till till probably one o'clock. Yeah, yeah. So I have half a day doing my yeah. stuff here. Then I can deal with the UK and then obviously carry on with, with mm. Dubai. But I, I think if if I was on my own, I think I'd already be living here. You'd already be living here, right? <laughs> That's quite good. We have so much in common. Like I'm, I am going to be in the movie, right? Because I'm going back to tell my wife. I got, great, I got great news. Babe, babe, <laughs> I'm going to be an babe, actor. I am going to still podcast. I'm still going to podcast, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I am yeah, going to be an actor. <laughs> exactly. Do you know the funniest thing is... Um, we went to a stand-up comedy show. Right. With a, there was a big group of us and watching it. And my wife was like, you know, you should really do stand-up comedy because you're really good at it. And I was like, babe, do you really want me to have another passion that brings no money into this house? <laughs> like, are you thinking about this, right? Do you know how long it takes to make money off stand-up comedy? Do you know what, though? If you could be, the, Vic, if you could be the Ricky Gervais of Dubai, though, that oh, could mate. pay you handsomely. Uh, yeah. That could it, pay you handsomely. It kind of could. But I'm just not going to spend another 10 years trying to make money no. out of this, mate. This is do, hard do, enough do, as it is. Do, do you know, Sam, I think whatever you fall into you know mm. the 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 reason i'm doing the tour is because it's giving the people that like these movies a chance to meet these people mm. in real life and have a conversation with them. so it build, keeps the fans happy yeah. um the podcast again it, it's a shop window for the content i've got the content i'm creating um and and, and you know it's something different um i've always been in, in, involved in property i made the typical mistake um in 88 and 89, the interest rates went over 10% mm. and they went up to just under 15 and we lost our house. So in the back of my mind, I was always thinking, my God, you know, we lost the house, we were homeless, but we, we obviously got rehoused. Mm. And then when I got on the property ladder, in the back of my mind, I was always thinking, I, I don't want to be holding on to this and yeah. it goes up to 15% again. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, and, and, you know, I went through 10 years in the property market and most of the property is doubled. And I thought, do you know what? I'm not going to be greedy. I'm going to take a profit. So I did that. And it's the biggest amount I ever made. Because if I'd have actually had somebody advising me properly, they'd have said, don't sell it, refinance it, buy another 20. Yeah. And then just keep doing that, doing that, doing that. And, and you know, if I'd have done that, I, yeah. I, but, but I always look at things. and It's think, always hindsight, right? But I always look at it and yeah. I think, I think, that was the choice I made. Yeah. And every choice you make has brought you to this exact position exactly. that you're in now. If you made uh, one wrong turn, then... And, and, and I look at... The, and that, that was the other draw for yeah. the property in Dubai because I'm thinking, so many of my friends are moving here. They're all going to want to buy a property. Mm -hmm. So many people that I don't know are buying property. And mm -hmm. uh, I've, I've got a real passion about it. And, uh, you know, I early, love... Yeah. I mean, I'm, I, I love the way... Uh, they sell the property as well. When you go into the developers in yeah. England, it's sort of just like you go on a building site and there's a site hut. And there's a guy going, oh yeah, these are the houses yeah, and yeah. there's a brochure. Here you actually walk into them and you go, this is what it's going to look yeah, like. Yeah. And you think, they've again... It's, They'll make some dummy ones for you to have a look at as well. Yeah. So you can actually walk in there and touch yeah. everything and you think, well, actually, if I was going to buy it, if I was buy it, looking to buy this, I'm buying it now. I'm not mm. going to go, I need to think about it. I'm like, where do I sign? So... I think the way that they set up the real estate here is unbelievable. Yeah. And that, that also made me excited about being involved in a property company. So uh, move into Dubai. Just let yeah. me know when you need it. I can get your property, man. Okay. It's, it's not Top a man. It's not a problem at all. <laughs> Dude, again, it's been an absolute pressure. Oh, you're, thanks, you're, you're family now. So anytime you want to come on and jump yeah. on and promote Appreciate everything. That. And, um, and, 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 if, and if you do 
any have any criminal connections, let me know. And come on, it's, it's, it's really bad because <laughs> I do want to say I've got so many guests for you, but I don't know how that plays out well, on well, my well, side well. on my reputation. Well, maybe, maybe just maybe just dance out on air and just yeah, yeah, you yeah, know yeah. send it to me privately. <laughs> I got your next ten seasons, bro. <laughs> um, but no, I've had a really good time. Thanks for yeah, having yeah. me on. No, and, dude, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, we, have, we, we we haven't actually done this yet, so we're, no, no, what no. we're going to do? We're going to. I'm just going to just put that there. Was that your actual move? Is that a bad move? <laughs> Guys, I've been AJ. He's been Terry. <laughs> Don't forget to like. Oh, wait. What platforms um, is it going to be shown on? Okay. The so, podcast. So for, for the visual, obviously, it's going to be YouTube. Yeah. Um, Bring the mic but, a bit closer there. I don't sorry, want to miss, sorry. To miss out. Um, yeah, so um, it's going to be YouTube for, uh, for visual. For yeah. um, these are Amazon, Spotify. Uh, I think there's 20 in total, but it's going to go out on all of them. Um, on it's either going to be the 14th or the 15th of September. Um, they're literally just finishing editing nice. first season and then they're going to start promoting it um, tomorrow. Boom. Um, so, yeah, which is the 4th, 5th? 5th, yeah. So they're going to start promoting from the 5th of September. And then, uh, and, and, and you know, I think like all these things, there'd be an audience yeah. found on somewhere. So yeah, it would yeah. either be... There'll, there'll always be. You, you'd, be or, you'd be surprised, dude. Most yeah. of my... Yeah. Like I get good views on YouTube, but yeah. we're getting like over a million downloads on audio a month. Amazing. So, which is weird to me. But then I start to realize a lot of people like to just be in their car and not, but you know, you know saying, not watch anything Pete, and listen. And like I put all this effort into making it look nice, and you guys just want to listen to it. But but do you yeah. know what I find, and this is mad. I find that if I listen to a podcast and I like the voice and I like the person, and I like the guest, yeah. I don't want to go and watch it and see yeah, what yeah. it look like. You know, yeah, so yeah, yeah. Um, you can kind of get two bites of the cherry. But, yeah, yeah. Um, makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, well, congratulations on, on your podcast. I wish you Thank every you so success. Much. I hope you get 10 million. I wish, I wish. Get 10 million because I'm, I'm rooting for you to get 10 But again, million. do you know what we were talking about before? If I get one view, right. I don't care. Yeah. Like I care less about the views because the connections and the friends and right. the family that I've made. You can't buy that. Through, right? You can't buy that, yeah. mate. You, you honestly can't. Like literally from meeting you, then meeting Matt, who... Right who I might introduce someone to him and he right. might introduce and, and the, the people that you get, like even think about the podcast you've done. Right. Like, did you know every single guest before? I only knew, uh, I only knew one of them. And look at the access you have now right. from, from. But that was, that was, a lot of it was because uh, a law firm sponsored yeah. the podcast and they said, oh, you should get King's Council on. Oh, yeah. do you know one? Oh yeah, speak to this guy. Oh, you should get a DCI on. You should speak to this guy. So I've had, Doors opened, and obviously it doesn't matter though if it's, if it's been opened or not. But if you now gone, have that that you didn't have yeah. before, but if you'd have gone knocking on the door, yeah, saying, "Oh, will you be on my car podcast?" I'd probably be like, "Why?" Yeah. But no, but what I'm saying is, right if you if you release that season, yeah, and you got four views on the whole season, doesn't matter the connections that you made <laughs> through <laughs> it. I feel I'd be upset. Nah, <laughs> you won't, mate. It's important, man. I think the connections that are made through this right. that you, 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 you can't buy them. You right. can't. Right. There's certain people that they can't. That's like, it's quite funny when someone, because you know you get people who they don't understand the work that goes behind what you do. Right. And they're like, I need you to connect me to this person. And I'm like, sure, 50 grand. <laughs> I'm not even joking. <laughs> they're like, what do you mean 50 grand? I'm like, 50 grand for the number. Right. Whether you do business with them or not. Right. They're like, that's a weird thing to say. I'm like, all right, you call them then. And let me know how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> like I don't have their number. I'd be like, you don't know the work that I did oh, yeah, yeah. for the last 20 years right. to get, not only to be able to have their number, but right. to be able to have that kind of relationship with them where I can call them just like that right. and say, hey, listen, do you want to do this or do that? Right. If you think it's easy, go and do it. If not, 50 grand <laughs> and here's my bank account details. People take it for granted and they just right. want to well, get it think, easy. People just, I mean, genuinely, um, you know, I only connect people if they're good people. Yeah. So if, if if someone said to me, I'm looking to do this and you're the man, I'll be saying, you got to meet AJ, AJ, you got to meet this guy mm. or this girl or whoever it is. Um, and I think at that point, you know, you don't mind doing it because you're connected to good people. But, but if you but know them well enough. Just random people going, yeah, yeah. Oh, do me a favour. Yeah, exactly. That's, that what, that's what I'm talking about. If it's, if it's someone different and I have a connection and some kind of, you right. know, story with, then of course I will. Right, right. But also I'll be like, remember, remember this because I might come back to you in the future <laughs> and go, remember when I saw you like that? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Because these things, they don't come easy. No. They don't. No. And also the, the big problem is if you do do that and then, yeah, and this happened to me once, um, somebody thought this person 
because they was with me, mm. was my friend, right? And then they started talking to them and they started doing business with them. And they said to me, oh, you know, that guy, blah, blah. And I was like, well, what, what about him? Mm. I will, you know, I've done this thing with him, blah, blah. And I was, like, I was like, well, what, what's what's he going to do with me? Yeah, yeah. Right? I said, I didn't introduce you. Yeah. Right, Albert, I thought he was all right to review. So, you, yeah. you know, you, you have to, um, mm. or, or, you know, I, I, I always, if, if I ever have any people around me like, like that, I always just get rid of them, right? Mm. Because obviously I'm an open guy, so I, I like to do good in everyone, but mm. I think occasionally you do attract people that aren't any good. And yeah. I think, you know, and they're always, like you said, they're trying to get into your network yeah. so they can get into these people for whatever reason. Yeah. And you have to, it's, it's hard because you've got to sort of just, yeah, exactly. start, you've got to become a guardian. It's, it's not that hard, it's friends. 50 grand, that's what yeah. it is. <laughs> like if I'm go if you're going to do something the stupid as well, the only problem that's going to cost me a friendship, at least I've got 50 grand out of it. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah, I don't, I don't know, I've, I've, I just, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm definitely a lot more, careful who I introduce people to mm. now than I've ever been. Because I just think, you, you, as I say, your net, net worth is your network. Is your net worth, that's it. You know what I mean? Because it's, you know, it's easy to build a, a really good network. Mm. And if, if you can introduce good people and, every, and good things happen, you know, you, you do make one bad introduction and then all of a sudden it's like, why did you introduce me to him? Or yeah, her? exactly. And then it's yeah. like, well, I thought you wanted to meet him. Yeah, Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But I give you 50 grand, AJ. That's fine. That's your, that's your business. That's your business. It's gone now. All I did was School fees, the they're number. expensive out here in Dubai. <laughs> now, dude, again. No, thanks, AJ. You're welcome. Thank you. Anytime. Thank you. Anytime. Anytime lot, my really good to meet you. Thanks for having me on. Pleasure. And again, anything you need in Dubai, just let me know. Um, 50 grand, I'll hook you up. Yeah. <laughs> Not I, a problem. I, I just, no, no. Have you got, you've got 50 grand, Matt, so we can... Oh, yeah, no, no. <laughs> I thought you were sitting quite high on that chair. I didn't realize why. That's why. Yeah, That's yeah, why yeah. he's bought he's it. He's on the side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Guys, I've been AJ. He's been Terry. Boom.